give a fuck that he smokes weed. They all smoke weed. Smoke weed every day. The following show is for mature audiences only. next thursday we've got the schedule release schedule, so there's yeah. something on the books every single week more or less outside of a couple weeks in the summer and then you know all summer we spend debating divisions and who's going to finish first and what the quarterbacks are going to look like in the afc south because there's a whole bunch of new ones like it's just it's never ending when kevin got wind that uh ryan was going to interview for the minnesota job same time he was interviewing for the bears job he reached out to him and said, like, anything you need, you know, these Kevin had been there for so many years, which, you know, they knew of each other, certainly. And, of course, they've been very cordial, I'm sure. You know, I don't know how many times they ran into each other over the years, but I know that there was the, like, he knew who he was. And, obviously, Kevin was a high-powered executive in his own right um, in the NFL at that time and then into the Big Ten. So... Kevin reached out to him before he made the decision to come down to Chicago and, and not take the Vikings job. And, you know, I, I know that that was like that relationship has been set in stone for a while. This isn't, hey, I started April 17th officially right. We're right. Starting off the ground. That's like big, actually, I think they already had a feeling that this thing was going to work. I am writing this, this, this feature on Ryan Poles for like the off season, And there's like a little part of it that I can you know, kind of share, like they were, there were some pretty important meetings that were happening at the combine, not just number one pick and changing hands. And I wrote about that, like how that whole process went down between Pol from the Bears side and from the Carolina side. But there's high powered agents meeting with the teams. Everybody yeah. who got free agents has their representatives. Everybody, th those people are there. Like they're meeting with teams before the legal tampering period starts. Yeah, it's the official start of free agency is the yeah. combine. Yeah. And so... Kevin Warren was there for a day because Ryan Poles wanted him there in those meetings. That doesn't happen. Like, no. I think about some of the other teams that I've covered and having the team president in the meetings with a general manager when the general manager manager's talking shop and numbers and salary cap and all these things with agents to try to gauge, hey, we're willing to go this far for a player financially. like. You just never see a team president involved at that level. So that to me, like that was where my antenna went up because that's different. Like that's, that's very different. You don't yeah. ever hear of that happen. So I checked around the league. I was like, am I crazy to think that this is kind of, you know, a noteworthy item. And I was told, no, I mean, like that's a pretty rare thing to see. You don't see team presidents walking around Indianapolis, the combine, you see general managers, you see coaches. I mean, they got Khalil Herbert in the sixth round two years ago. And I thought that was a great pick at the time. I really like this because I think that the more competition you bring to that room and attempt to take some pressure off of the quarterback, because we know he's going to want to run in moments, but not 170 carries again and 170 rushes again for him. Exactly. It's, it's a, it's a good start in, I mean, everything here is pointed towards them supporting Justin Fields from Darnell Wright to Roshan Johnson, um, you know, even dating back to, to DJ Moore, like you bring in somebody like Johnson who is like known for being a tone setter in terms of pass protection. Like you have to have somebody who wants to like do that role. Draft Doctor 
Phil and the smartest man. Keeping it 100. Yeah. Keeping it 100. Yeah. Yeah. Trading up. 100. Yes! yes. What? Oh my Here God. it is! For this recording. Okay. The tape never lies. You'll never know how good your football team is going to be until you play with maximum effort. Keep it 100. Keep it 100. Open competition over the North and never give it back. Smartest man. My Chicago Bears select Justin Fields, quarterback, Ohio State. Cuts had to be me, we added the Barbara moderator Up and down, boys got you double checking Sad sack scrolling like a fool drunk Texting, flexing on the truth Cause you know they'll never change Real, recognize real, that's what you get with Phil and Jimmy What the name? What we do when we're breaking down the bears Fuck a play or a captain All of the unchair The truth, you see We laugh, we are lie So there's no babies like Maybelline Straight to the truth with the acumen and facts We got a sad nerd, but he's not just giving her stats Car crash, big impact like trip sad Every Wednesday night you got the smartest man to feel bad Now we know you're smiling like a fat kid with fun dip. We're back better than ever and we're keeping it 100 Keep it 100 Keep it 100 Draft Dr. Phil and the smartest man Justin Fields gets outside the pocket Puts that ball perfectly where only Moody can get it Keep it 100 Two feet right where y'all supposed to be we have a fun show for y'all tonight we got brian perez of bears talk joining us so i'm not gonna hold y'all up you i'm gonna bring y'all out who y'all here to see so we're gonna start with the smartest man hey hey we got a right tackle and we got sheree back <laughs> and we gonna bring in on my boy ddp hey <laughs> finally got a tackle and you're right we got a she a don't play bingo <laughs> Maybe she does, but she wins. <laughs> so good to have you back, Sheree. You nailed the intro there. Mm-hmm. Claudio could take some lessons from you. Yeah, poor um, Claude. Have you been great? Not you at all, Claude. While you were out? I mean, Claudio's been replaced. Let's go and make that announcement now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excited to have you back. I'm so you know? glad to be back. It reminds me of back in the 80s. I think it was McDonald's. You deserve a break today. It's like, <laughs> I think all of us deserve a break after the draft coverage. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Done. These last couple of days have been very peaceful for me, but exhausted at the same time. But it's it's great. It's great. I don't know who's taller, Yoda or me. I'm going to advantage me because this is oh, i thought that was i didn't even i thought that was bryce i thought that was bryce young on your t-shirt <laughs> i nice. know i'm short right <laughs> listen it ain't gonna change i'm all, i'm almost gonna be 50 this You're summer so, i mean yeah. come on man the growth the growth chart the percentiles the no PH, more growth spurts for PH. you, right? Yeah, I don't see it. But we definitely grow in a huge way when we have Cherie back in the oh, building. Yeah. There's bullets. Welcome her back. 
We also got a great show tonight. Uh, I've worked with Brian Perez. We worked together at Bears Wire. We told the story of the hat. Should I take my hat off? Right. It's like an episode <laughs> of Seinfeld. It's it's crazy. But I really respect this dude and, and his football acumen. I've been, I've been trying to take a po more positive swing as Shane or Ryan Cox send me other Bears analysts. And they they since I left Twitter, they've grown ex potentially. Is that how you say it? Exponential? How do you say it? Yeah, it definitely wasn't like the way that you started it off. Yeah. <laughs> like weeds. You fucked that all up. <laughs> I'll ask the attorney when he comes in how to say that because I'm sure he's used it in a courtroom. <laughs> but it's grown. And I got to say, my reviews are in. There's a lot of frauds out there still. If we had some weed killer in regards to dumb football takes, like pretending that you know the game, it's pretty crazy how many people get fooled by these shoe salesmen. And then you got Matt Nagy as evidence. It happens to billion dollar franchises. There you It'll go. Happen to you. Keys guys got you covered, Phil. <laughs> There's your word. Exponentially. Exponentially. Okay. There you go. Did I say it right? Yeah. Exponentially. Yeah. They're growing exponentially like a cornfield in Iowa. I'm not smart. I know you're not. That's obvious. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> That's why we love Sheree. <laughs> but we're happy to have Lady Bear back. We're going to get into a lot of discussion about what the Bears did in the draft like we did last week. And we're going to kind of make our best guess for the opener. Bears opener. But Sheree, since you're back real quick, you have anything... You want to say i miss you guys we missed you too um <laughs> no i do want to thank you all for giving me that time that i needed to try to step away and focus on me so thank you both for being understanding and supportive here's the real question shri who did you miss the least amount from ttnl <laughs> Wait, he said something positive about us, Shane, because we get blackballed like we're so mean. I was I was chatting back and forth with Sheree today. Yeah, and I'm like, hey, can you want to so do that's the why he wants me to say that because he sent me the cutest video that he knows is forever be in my heart of uh, yep. him saying hi to me. So uh, her, there you go. Her name and her, said her name and everything. You can say he, it's Bratcher. You can say it's Bratcher. It's fine. <laughs> ding ding. Perfect time. <laughs> I was like calling y'all since he threw me under the bus. First day. <laughs> Claudio's still calling you Sherry. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, Jesus. Put a you shit in your hat and get the hell up. Tell him, coach. <laughs> That's right, Claudio. Tell him, coach. Anyway, Sheree, we're gonna bring you back. But we're gonna jump in. Our guest has been patiently. Enjoying the shrimp cocktail and the spread yeah. that we put out in the green room. We got hell the CHDO money. Hell of, a coffee, hell of a coffee in the green room, he said. <laughs> Lifesaver. <laughs> are you a are you a Keurig guy, Shane? Or are you yeah, just we got a we got a Keurig. Are you what brand are you buying? Are you going Duncan? Are you uh I pay for it? I don't Mountain? pick it out. Yeah, I don't do the grocery oh, shopping. I Oh, you I don't, don't pick it out. Yeah. One you pick out? No. My debit card is in use every time <laughs> groceries are bought, but I'm usually not there. We'll just say I, that. I, I got to get the Starbucks hazelnut. I like that's Green Mountain. Yeah. Green Mountain, yeah. Actually, I think that's what we have. Green Mountain Green is like Mountain. the backup plan to our house. But anyway, without further ado, let's bring this guy out in the way we do. This guy has, has broken down the bears on more websites than we can even fucking count. And now he's got his own on Bears Talk. Let's bring him out. Brian Perez. Hey, baby. We're going to be here all day. We're going to be here all day, baby. I like this Bears kind of party. Fans. I like this kind of party, baby. As we sit back and get ready for the season. 
why not invite a guy on that loves this team just as much as we True. You know? Look at you. I'm proud of you. Yeah, thank you. Although, we're not going to hold his O.J. Howard love against him, though. No, God! No, God, please, no! No! Bears fans. TTNL fans. Get up out your seats and give it up for the managing editor of the Bears Talk, Brian Perez. The team never lies, keeping it 100. There he is. It's good stuff, man. That's good stuff right there. And you know what? I really credit you for remembering my love for O.J. Howard. Oh, That's yeah. going I, back a few I, years, and I still stand by it. He's been yeah. a bust, but he he got hurt early in his career. Was never really used. I was right. with you. I was with really you, man. I, I was OJ. a I was a I'm an Alabama guy through and through, and I I loved OJ, but oh my god, all the talent, all the talent in the world surrounded by all that talent, and his biggest game he ever played in was the last one he played in, and everybody went absolutely True. ape shit. But talent was there for sure. Absolutely, man. I love. I I mean. The crush lives on for me. I still, I still, <laughs> what could have been? Is there any other guy that you can remember? Like, yo, I, mine was Chance Warmack. I thought he was going to be Bro, a star. That's not even, but I love Deshaun Kaiser, dude. You remember that? I was a Deshaun Kaiser guy. Same so I, would say, I would say one of my biggest misses in probably, I guess, I don't know what draft class this was. This maybe is 14 or 15. It's Tavon Austin. I loved uh, Avon yeah. Austin. I thought he was yeah. going to be a game wrecker in the NFL. And, you know, you sometimes underrate the limited route tree. Those West Virginia wide receivers had a run back then. Kevin White was a victim of that, too. And I was just convinced Tavon Austin was going to just be the guy that everyone thought Reggie Bush would be when he was coming out. And couldn't do it. He made a couple splash plays, had his moments, got paid big money, but he, oh, yeah. he didn't make the impact we thought he would make. That's a good name, man. I thought he was going to definitely be a better pro as yep. well than he was a game break. I mean, I remember Bears Twitter then was in love with him. Yep. Yeah. I can remember way back in the day. I was, what, so it would have been, what, 05? No, it wouldn't have been 05. Whatever, whatever year Mike Williams, USC Mike Williams came mm. out. I was oh. a USC Mike Williams fan. Yep. Back in the day, I never whole different, liked that dude. whole different game, whole different game whole back different then. Receiver but, yeah. prototype you look for those yeah. big body guys. He he was he had like um, an incredible freshman season, I think, at USC. Yeah, right? and he was one yeah. of those guys that started that conversation. Let these guys come out after their freshman year. Yeah, and um, yeah, well, he still was the first round. Right. Detroit took him right. The Lions, yeah, yeah. Detroit yeah. took like four receivers. <laughs> yeah, in a row. Yeah, Charles, Charles Rogers, Charles the, Rogers, yeah, Rogers yeah, Megatron, Michigan yeah. State. But I, Mike Williams. I was just having a Megatron. talk with my buddy. We were in Myrtle Beach in 2001 leading up to the draft. And that was the whole David Terrell versus Corin Robinson. Who was going to who was going to oh, fall? Yeah. So those NCC. those were the days. <laughs> Listen, it, and it doesn't stop from back no. then. I mean, some guys that we've been talking about in this year's draft. Yeah, we're going to look back five or six years from now. Remember, oh, remember everybody wanted Jordan Addison or yeah. Jackson Smith and Jigba, and they could be the next Kevin White or Mike Williams or one of these guys. I mean, it happens every year. We'll be lucky if we get 40% of the first rounders that actually become legitimate players in the league. So yeah. you spend all these months breaking down the draft, debating who you want and all the stuff. And then once the draft is over, you close the book on it. You could be an undrafted free agent like Sanborn and outplay first round linebackers that don't even make it to a second contract. Yeah, you know, Phil That's and I are both on record this wide receiver club. We we weren't touching any wide receiver in the first round. And yeah, I think guys. Smith and Jigba was like uh kryptonite to me. I wanted nothing to do with that. Nothing. You know, I, I got some Jalen Carter were my kryptonites and Skaronsky in his arms, but <laughs> I, I took some heat on Twitter when draft season kicked off because i said it wasn't necessarily my personal opinion but you guys know i have um access to certain information inside the draft world yeah. and i know that the scouts nfl teams started the 
this college football season with a third round grade on him. And draft Which Twitter was very different on Jackson exactly. Smith and Jigman. Yeah. yeah exactly. And you know, draft Twitter creates a narrative that he's a top 10 guy and it's you consume it every day. Okay. And that becomes yeah. the truth when in reality behind the scenes, NFL teams had him graded as a third round guy. And while some people might say, well, hey, he went 19th overall, whatever it was, he was a first round pick. Well, was he a first round grade though? You know, there might have only been in this year's draft 12, 13, 14 guys with a first round grade. You need 32, well, this year 31 players to make up a first round. It doesn't right. mean he had a traditional first round grade entering the league. Fact, he was a third round guy entering the season. So, um, you know, you got to be careful. Draft Twitter is a dangerous, oh, yeah. dangerous place that you can get lost in groupthink and fall in love with a player that really doesn't warrant it. Yeah, and it works, it works the other way too. I can remember back. What would have been the what 14 draft? Was that the Aaron Donald year? If early yeah. on in the process, you were drafting him in the second and third rounds. Yep. And then he went up and we're all praying that he falls to Chicago one pick away. But yeah, it works both ways. But you're right, man. It gets drilled into fans' heads and they yep. they think that everybody believes that. And it's just not that way. Darnell writes another one. I mean, yep. Early on in the process, people are like, oh, you know, that's a third round talent right there. We can get him round three. But we Top took 10 draft pick. early in the offseason when we started talking about Darnell Wright. We were getting a lot of criticism. And again, just to kind of piggyback off what you're saying, Brian, I mean, you know me well enough now. This is my my baby here watching tape and talking about it, not writing about it, but talking about it. And the reality of staying your self, knowing what you see and not worrying about all those other people. And I talked about it and I had to remind fans of this too, when we were so hard on Jalen Carter by watching his tape and we were so against Adam Hogue and all of these other guys that were calling Skaronsky the cleanest prospect and the bet. And I'm looking at tape where, where, and I go, watch Darnell Wright. You want to see clean? Skaronsky can't hold a candle to Darnell Wright. And it, it aligned up exactly where the Bears were. And it was a proud moment for TTNL because we were fighting for these truths and. And, and away from the narratives when it came to this kind of whatever whatever agent. I hear McShay. I'll just use him as an example, and you could talk about it. Shane will send me these shows. I don't really watch anything anymore or listen to shows or podcasts because I don't want anybody to interfere until I've decided, and then I'll listen to it. So Shane will send me. But I was listening to First Draft with Kuiper and McShay. And if you really listen, every time it's McShay or Kuiper talking about people they talk to in the league, say, and now all of a sudden their rankings move based on who they talk to in the, according to these people in the league, they got them as the, and that's just not how you should do it, in my opinion. And, and as a Bears guy yourself, kind of in the same tree that we are in, You've been around them. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, to touch on the whole Peter Skaronsky thing, I felt like that was a real disservice to draft fans, Bears fans, football fans in general when the comment was made that why is this conversation of Peter Skaronsky getting kicked inside the guard happening? He's never played guard. He's a tackle, blah, 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 whatever was tweeted out. I mean, that is just a complete and utter – um I mean, miss, to put it politely. NFL teams do this all the time. You have certain positional thresholds that you have to meet in order to project at a certain position in the league. So and it, it, no position does this apply more to than offensive tackle, where arm length is the golden trait of offensive tackles. You could be the greatest offensive tackle in the last 10 years in college football. If your arms are 32, 31 and a half inches, you are not – playing offensive tackle in the NFL. You're just not because the, the edge rushers that you're facing at the college level, maybe 80% of your season 
you're not facing an NFL edge rusher who has exactly. 33 and a half inch arms. So with your 31 or 32 inch arms, you can do just fine. You can be an all American, but it doesn't project forward to the NFL game. You see like Zach Martin in Dallas was a great offensive tackle in college. Now he's one of the best guards in the NFL and nobody has even really debated that topic. I mean, it's the fact that it's just what the NFL teams do. They kick these guys inside. So I think what ended up happening is the success that Rashawn Slater had in his first year in the same helmet, you know, Northwestern yeah. guy did it before. So this is the next Rashawn Slater. That is a slippery slope and it just doesn't apply to historical precedent at the position. And I think when you ignore that, you're just ignoring the fundamentals of scouting and that misleads draft fans thinking, well, Peter Skaronsky would have been a better pick than Darnell Wright. But no, he wouldn't have been. The Bears don't need a guard. Exactly. We have to center in the top 10 because Skaronsky might end up being a center. Cody Whitehair is a perfect example. I know they're not the same physical profile player, but Cody Whitehair doesn't have the length to play tackle in the league. He played tackle at Kansas State. He kicks inside the center and guard his whole career. So this is that was a really frustrating phase of, of draft season because I feel like Bears fans ended up tearing players that they wanted in the first round because of some stuff that they're fed by big name analysts that are just, just incorrect. Um, when it comes to what you're saying, Phil, about forming your opinion on players, I think there is a kind of a cross section that happens. You know, we have the average fan who doesn't have maybe the time, commitment, dedication, or love for the process like the three of us do and probably a lot of the people that are watching right now. We dive into the film. We write our scouting reports. We create our big boards. It's a passion slash hobby slash it's what we do. Not every fan does that. So you, when you have the casual fan listening to a personality who says, oh, these I talk to this person in the league, that makes them think it's gospel. It's the truth. While well, people inside the league are telling this guy this information exactly. must be so connected that I got to listen to his opinion. That's why you're seeing, uh, unfortunately, on Twitter, a lot more uh, accounts popping up. There's a couple of Twitter handles right now representing themselves as kind of like Chicago Bears insiders and using clouding their tweets with the word source. And it's just aggregating other information that's readily available on social media online. Um, but they start building a following because if you refer to people inside the league, your opinion somehow gets more credibility. So I think it's a, it's a tactic that some of the big media people use and small timers are trying to use to become big media. But if you really care about it, I always say, just trust your own eyes and who gives a Absolutely. shit what anybody else says. If you, I, I just, I love Tavon Austin. I loved OJ Howard. Who cares that they busted? I mean, right. you, you get some people like old school guys, like maybe a Greg Gabriel, for example, who gets annoyed with draft analysts because there's no accountability. Right. There's no accountability for the blogger, for the writer. Who cares? That's what we chose. Right. Like, that's why we're doing this. I don't want to earn a living or feed my family on a scouting report. Right. Because right, inherently right. you're going to be wrong 70 percent of the time, most likely. So if you choose that as your profession, then you're choosing the accountability that comes along with it. We're providing content, entertainment, information, informing. You're going to be wrong. It's OK. You move on. But um so trust your eyes. Don't fear being wrong. I think sometimes groupthink becomes the um, the overriding narrative with draft season. Everybody wants to think the same way because people are afraid of going outside the lines, having a different opinion. And then if that opinion ends up being wrong, now you feel like you lost some fake credibility in fake social media. It, it, none of that matters. Just trust your eyes. Go with your gut. It makes it more fun. Like you said, Phil. You guys were all fired up when Darnell Wright was the guy, right? right. You felt that right. bad of honor because you trusted your opinion, you trusted your eyes, you trusted your gut, and it makes it—it it does make it more fun too. Oh, Brian, where, where did you? Put, yeah, yeah, go so ahead, Phil. You put your your energy and you devote a network to the tape. I don't rely on a somebody in the league when I've been around football my whole life. I've seen people in the league. That are shoes they shouldn't even be in the league. They were oh, a exactly. friend of a friend, and we've and I use Nagy as an example, but there's a million other Naggies. Trust me, and people get offended. What What do you coach? Where did you go? Well, I have a family. I had to make different choices. I've turned down job. That doesn't measure up. I'm sitting in front of you, breaking it down. I'm not afraid to go 
and look at the tape. And I think when you show it, and to your point, which is a great one, I thought it was, I got so agitated by it. And Peter Skaronsky and his family could be the greatest people. And it's so unfortunate because it was like, you're feeding a false narrative. It's so neglectful. And it just wasn't even in the vicinity of truth. And that, it, it just upset me to the point where it even took shots at Darnell Wright. And I'm like, you know what, is, you know what I feel Dave, just to jump in here. I think what gets ahead. me frustrated yeah. is I well, I, I am the ultimate fan of different opinions, right? So if yes. there's an opinion out there of a Bears fan, draft fan analyst, one of the people, anybody commenting here that thinks Peter Skaronsky is going to be a 10 year all pro offensive tackle, left tackle, or right tackle, awesome. You might be right. Trust your eyes. But when it's delivered to the fan base, as if, duh, of course he's going to – who's even thinking he's going to go to guard? I know so much more than you. This is ridiculous that anybody's saying he's going to be a guard. That's, like, offensive. It's like, ah, oh, come on. Like, no, nobody's got it. Nobody needs to have that level of self-importance um, to suggest that decades' worth of scouting precedent doesn't apply because this is your opinion. Right. You can't you can't ignore that stuff. That's why Bryce Young, when you have Mike Tannenbaum and Lombardi and all these former GMs feel like you said, these guys were probably better off selling shoes than calling shots in the war room because they're suggesting the Bears move on from fields and draft Bryce Young along those same lines with the offensive tackle arm length thing. Look, Bryce Young might be a phenomenal NFL quarterback, but I'm not risking my employment on an absolute outlier at quarterback. The game's most important position. I would never, ever have considered him the number one pick in the draft simply because I would need to see that guy do it in the league before I take the next one that is like him because we haven't really seen it happen yet. So you had guys who sat in the big chair, made draft day decisions, saying the Bears would be better off with Bryce Young than Justin Fields. And I hope Bears fans, and well, first of all, I hope for the Bears that that turns out to be a completely ridiculous opinion. Two, three years from now, we do a look back and Justin yeah. Fields is an all pro and Bryce Young. I hope he has a great career, but he's not Justin Fields. And Bears fans have to hold those guys responsible, right? I mean, those oh, guys yeah. are on big media. They're on ESPN. They're on NFL Network spewing this stuff. And Bears fans just have to go after their mentions because I, I want to just clear something off for big Tony, the pod man <laughs> and others. I said, Brian. In my opinion, the t if Justin and and Bryce were coming out, I preferred Bryce, the quarterback, coming out. And that's how I felt and stood by it. In this situation. We would have quite the war room conversation. Exactly. That would have that been fun. We should have had this conversation before the draft. Because that would have oh, been fun. We, the, we did. Him and I did. I'm on did. I'm on team Perez with we, this one 100 oh, percent And I'm an Alabama and I'm an Alabama guy. But I don't flip-flop or hide from this. But that's great. Just to your point, yeah. that's we will go back and we'll look. But I would never say, and I and I'm just clearing this up. Okay, we move on from Justin. No, you've committed to Justin. We haven't had a proper analysis of this guy based on what the bears and Ted Phillips and company neglected him. So it would be the wrong move to, to move on from Justin. And in this scenario, if they were both were coming out, I would have preferred Bryce young to Justin Fields. And I stand by that a hundred percent. And here's the other thing. When what you're talking about the Justin Fields, right? Analysis is the investment in fields, moving on, sticking with them, whatever. Yeah. It's it's obviously it's way too soon, right? To know right. is Justin Fields. I have all the faith and confidence this guy's gonna blow up in 2023. Um, and that's not Bears bias, Bears fan. This guy has been built from the ground up for this moment to be an NFL superstar. And he had a waste of a rookie season. Last year, you saw everything slowly start to click with wide receivers who would only be in the NFL if they were on the Bears last year because no other roster would have had space for some of these guys. And you they were like Symbol Webster players. as a third down target, Brian. <laughs> it, it, that's what I'm saying. Like, think about <laughs> think about that, right? Um, 
And now with this supporting cast, the second year with the same coaches, same system, same playbook, he's not having to relearn verbiage. He's building timing with DJ Moore. And guess what? Chase Claypool is still a pretty good wide receiver. These guys, it's going to be a totally different world. But the right. point is you can't be completely like ignore the fact there is still a bust factor with every player, including Absolutely. Justin Fields. And if after year three, you don't see what you want to see from him, the best front offices always are looking ahead, right? So let's say the Bears said this is the year that we're going to, we you know, we're giving up on Fields. We're going to make a trade. We're going to keep the one pick. We're going to take Bryce Young. We're going to trade Fields. Next year's draft has a better quarterback in no, Caleb Williams. Fact, and they did the our, right thing. Yeah, we arguably argued. Drake May's better too. So you know what? Give Fields this year. Exactly. And no doubt he'll be the he'll be the guy for the next six to eight. Stay but if for there. some reason he doesn't work out, you got two for ones, and then you make that move. We said, Shane and I, this is the brilliance of doing it early because you I so you wouldn't have got DJ Moore had you waited the draft night. Cars has talked about Shane has talked. I believe in that too, but I want to stay there because I say, and I'll say it to you, Jesus in there. The story on Mac Jones is not over. In fact, Mac Jones was the best performing rookie quarterback and that has a defensive coordinator coming and all. And we know that. So we turn the page and write these narrative. No, the bears Ryan Poles did the right thing, moving down, support Justin Fields, and do exactly what you said, Brian. You, we had to get that one next year mm -hmm. because you have to cover your ass. That's why I said you got to do your due diligence on Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud. You can't just turn the pay. You, you've been without a fucking quarterback for centuries, centuries. <laughs> so, no, no, we got – no. I, I'm not saying Justin Fields is the man. Like, he's got to go out there and prove he knows the problem because I'm with you. K if Caleb Williams was in this draft, I was moving on from Justin Fields. That's my truth. And I've said it, hey, Seuss, and I say it to everybody else because when I watch the tape, it doesn't lie to me. This guy is like Aaron Rodgers and Mahomes mixed together. And I have never seen a quarterback this, this proficient in, in college since, you know, USC. So now you got those two first round picks. If you suck, if you've protected yourself here and Justin has to have pressure on him, it's the, it comes with the job, comes with the job, man. And you saying take, you take Caleb Williams right now. I mean, that's not a knock on Justin Fields. There's a lot of teams. No in the league with young oh, yeah. first round quarterbacks that would move on and take Caleb Williams because he is, you know, the word generational doesn't really, I, I hate using that word, but right. you know, he's kind of on that Trevor Lawrence level where Trevor Lawrence was, you know, can't miss Caleb Williams is going to be um, Caleb Williams is, I mean, the guy's a superstar. So yeah, that, that would be a really difficult conversation so to have me, you and Shane are, I'm the coach, you two, he's the college, you're the GM. If Caleb was there, I'd be fighting to have that because I know what I know in regards to that. There's no question in the elbow and the relief. There's no question. He's making plays by throwing the football and running the football. Accuracy up the asshole. It's everything I want. And he's a confident son of a bitch that I like throwing the football. So I would fight for that. Would you – be in that business with the first overall pick me yeah you That's a yeah I, I would have if i had the one pick and caleb's in this draft i'm taking caleb williams and i'm worried about my quarterback situation later exactly. because at that point you're gonna have a player like justin fields who came basically one start away from breaking the nfl's all-time rushing record for a quarterback who flashed enough with his arm talent who the narrative around justin fields his whole time in his career is that the Chicago Bears are what's breaking him, not he isn't a good quarterback, that the Bears are destroying him mentally, physically, and what have you. There are plenty of teams that don't have a quarterback. That You don't think the Carolina Panthers would like a do-over and have Justin Fields instead of having to do what they did to their franchise this year and having to trade up for Absolutely. Bryce Young? So them getting a second swing at Justin Fields, they would take it 
I'm certain they would have done that. The Colts probably the Colts drafted Anthony Richardson, who is a oh, yeah. profiles like Justin Fields. So he would have obviously ranked high on their wish list too. So the Bears would have been able to do something if Caleb Williams was in this draft. But my hope, gentlemen, is that we don't have to worry about quarterback for another 10 years. And the guy is there. And I have no doubt in my mind, Justin Fields is that dude. I'm with you there too. And I think one thing that fans tend to overlook, obviously the trade down is is you're covering your bases with the quarterback next year, whatever it happens. But you can look along the lines of you're also covering your bases if – Braxton Jones doesn't works out and Fashanu's staring you in the face or all from Notre Dame, right? You know, anything yeah. like that. It, it's, and you can, the receiver from Ohio state. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's the real it's a, receiver from, Ohio it's a brilliant state. move no matter what. And I mean, the, the fact that there was people out there, like you brought up Tannenbaum and uh, who's the other jackass that was in Cleveland there for a while. Um, Lombardi. 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 Yeah. Lombardi. And they they would sit there and spew all this stuff, and they're oh, we got to reset the financial clock. All you put Justin Fields on the open market. There, there's going to be teams lining up mm -hmm. to to bring him in, and that that's what it's all about. And I, I think it's funny you hear idiots like Peter Bukowski and stuff like that trying to spew hate, and Justin Fields is awful. And he, you can say whatever you want. I'm not a big believer in watching the top 100 list but players know they released one of the the top 100 lists did you see that today the top no, 25 no. one of the players they released the screenshot of his survey he had justin fields at number 17 wow second quarterback listed behind patrick mahomes wow that's big what player was yeah. that though that's big no 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 that's an, they're not releasing that oh, they not. don't release whose it was but that was an official List and a I mean, that's does, a shame. That's a huge. It that's is a huge fine players, because players. That, that means one of the so much. Players. It does. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> we had bias. Shane. You remember Shane Matthews, the Bears' backup <laughs> quarterback, was on with us, and we were talking. And I said, Shane, one thing that I've always wondered is, you know, you have the rookie mini camp, and then the vets come in, and when the you know the vets show up, and you see these rookies, how long does it take you? And he's like, listen. He's like, when we drafted Cade McNown, we got to the very first practice about 15 minutes in. And my exact words were, we drafted this motherfucker in the first round. He can't fucking throw. And the entire <laughs> fucking team said that. They knew, talking right? about Cade yeah. McNown. Players know faster than anybody. Coaches are going to cover their ass. Personnel people are going to cover their ass. Players know. It's true, man. It says, it's totally it says true. a lot. It's always been that way. And just, I'm not just saying too. They just want, I mean, good coaches know, but yeah, Justin Fields has things he's got to work on, but at no point at his, in his bears tenure, have I ever thought to myself, Jesus, I hope he's out there putting in the work. You know, he is exactly. He's been that his entire life. Exactly, man. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't – he needs football. He craves it. It's what he wants. And I, I'm with you, man. I am I am full steam ahead on board. There's going to be bumps in the road. Absolutely. It's going to be part of the growth am, process. For the record, I am with everybody. I think people get so anxious. If you want sunshines and rainbows, go find that after dark because it ain't going to happen here. It's – I'm telling you the truth of what the conversation is. If you think Justin Fields is going to throw for 5,000 yards, and you, we don't know. But the, ba the best thing that has ever happened, aside from Ted Phillips being gone and, and Kevin Warren, because that's number one in my book, is this trade down and the scenario to prepare and build around this kid. Because the goal should be, Yes, you got to cover your ass, but you want to see him take that next step where he's winning games for you, surrounded by a plan offensively and players that are making plays. And to your credit and, and ours here, you know, what he had surrounding him, it wasn't very good at receiver and it was horrible on the offensive line. And it makes me question coaches 
for putting him in these situations and watching some of the players that were playing out there. It makes me question uh, Chris Morgan. I don't, I don't see the hype around this offensive line coach on tape. I don't see it. I don't see fundamentals. I don't see players finishing and knowing. I see one guy doing that last year. And it was Tevin Jenkins, who was in, he's he's on the outside, whatever he was. But now we're gonna see this year. Hopefully it changes. But this quarterback, Brian, if he is surrounded by talent, he takes that step. The sky is the limit, and it should be an investment in him. Uh Marvin Harrison Jr. And the I love the Penn State tackle Shane's talking about, by the way. You know, and if you look at you look at the young quarterbacks who have broken out in recent years, I mean, it's all kind of followed this Bears model that's been applied this year. You know, Josh Allen was ascending, but he broke out with Stefan Diggs, right? Yes. Stephon Diggs. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jalen Hurts was AJ Brown. Like there was like literally questions about Jalen Hurts. Not like exactly. 18 months ago, Jalen Hurts was not the Eagles guaranteed future. A.J. Brown, an investment with Devonta Smith in the first round. Jalen Hurts is an MVP candidate now. Um, and the list goes on and on with guys who have And been, he's highly paid, Brian. Yeah, he's, <laughs> listen, he's got his money now, man. You know, and every one of these top young quarterbacks tends to have the team invest in them. Even Trevor Lawrence. We all busted chops about what the Jaguars did last offseason with some of the guys they signed. But you know what? Christian Kirk and, and the tight end and the guys that they brought in there – a hodgepodge of wide receivers who are all probably slightly above average talents combined to give Trevor Lawrence some actual options in the passing game. I mean, uh, Justin Fields was throwing at Dante Pettis. I like Dante Pettis. I, Dante Pettis is fine, but Dante Pettis was out of the league. Like right. he was from the 49ers, looked like he was a star in the making, out of the league, maybe a reclamation project with the Giants, and then like barely He's a hanging on. Receiver. When they when the Bears signed him, it was an afterthought signing. Maybe yeah. he makes it through training camp, and he ended up becoming one of the better wide receivers on the Bears. Not one of the better wide receivers in the NFL. Just that's it was reminding me back to the days when Kendall Wright was the number one receiver in yeah. Chicago. That yeah. level of wide receiver core yeah. that really didn't give the offense any chance. And now the leveling up with DJ Moore. I, I don't think Bears. I, I don't think fans appreciate. No, how talented DJ Moore is. Right. This oh. dude Speak is on. a star. He's a star. He just has been in the in no man's land in Carolina. Nobody has cared about the Panthers over the last few years. He's had no quarterbacks throwing him the ball. The op the opportunity he has to become an NFL superstar with you know catching passes on the other end of Justin Fields in one of the biggest media markets in the country for a young and ascending team. Um DJ Moore is, is a legitimate X factor, and 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 look, he has that temperament too, Brian. Oh, he's, where a, he's it's a, not he's too big for him. Hundred percent too big for Before him. Before AJ Brown came to the Eagles, he had two thousand yard seasons that just cracked a thousand yards. And I know yeah. people are saying DJ Moore is not AJ Brown. Well, AJ Brown was not AJ Brown exactly until this year. Exactly. So people, I mean, people forget DJ Moore was a very highly regarded <laughs> prospect coming out. And, and, dude, and, and we loved them. I and, think we were doing contract, the draft. They got cost control Maryland. for the next three years. Maryland, yep. Big and cost controlled, exactly. Yes. There's so many things to like about him. We haven't had uh, that kind of dog, Brian, at receiver. And what I mean by that is that the stem of the route you are going to get after the football, no matter what is awaiting you. I'm trying, like Tom Waddle, people lived off that, but the athleticism in Waddle wasn't there. He'll be the first to one to tell you. I would say the be he's the best receiver the Bears have had probably since Brandon Marshall. When Brandon that Marshall is, was in town, that dude, he, yeah. Br Brandon I'm Marshall was a guy who That's you knew the, the ball's in the air. He's a, it's his ball, right? Exactly. Alshon Jeffrey had his moments, but Brandon Marshall was a dude. He was just an alpha on the field. DJ Moore physically isn't the same measurables, but athletically and just what he can do in terms of his hands, the size of his hands, the strength of his hands, his vertical Great. jump. His ability to beat defenders deep, intermediate and short. Dude's a three-level player. He's if Justin Field and look, like you said, it's not all rainbows and butterflies, Phil. If Justin Fields can't make plays with DJ Moore and a rebuilt offensive line, next year this time we're having a different conversation. It's just honesty, right? It's Absolutely. just being honest. Just honest. 
That's the expectations are to no break through, but he, 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 he made, Brian, he made plays. I, how old are you, Brian? I'm sorry, Shane. 45. Huh? 45. 45. You 45 Shane going on 23. What's huh? that? I'm <laughs> going on 50. Shane's 40 gonna be 45, right? Or you are? No, I'm I'm 46. Yeah, sorry. So yeah. we're all in the same kind yeah. of I'm just older than you all. So I'm tired of this shit. I'm tired of the quarterback. I told our guy on our network, Eric Kramer, that one year in 95 was the That's first it, time in my life that no matter what I was doing, going to the local bar to watch the Bears on one of those giant satellite dishes where they had those bubble TVs on every <laughs> booth, I felt I knew our quarterback play was going to be fine that day. I just, mm -hmm. I just didn't have and to worry about that. And our <laughs> defense sucked. And our defense sucked that time. That was it. But I mean, bombs to Graham and Conway and and in cutting. It was like, oh god, this is what the NFL passing looks like. And it was only for one fucking season. And yep. I haven't felt like that. There obviously was moments with Cutler, but you, you. Even I, as a big Cutler supporter, never could sit on the end of the seat feeling comfortable. Even up 20. Yep. Up oh, here goes a here, fumble. Here's oh, an you knew if, you knew call. if Jay threw a interception in the pick. first two series, there was another one coming before half. Exactly. That was that was Jay. Wasn't his first pass as a bear against the Packers an interception? I believe Jay Cutler might have been. He I'm 99 percent sure he's he first four of that game. Season throw, yeah, was a pick, and it, at that moment, I was like, "This fucking team is cursed." Like yeah. Cutler's <laughs> first throw that we've been waiting for this anticipation, and it's intercepted. His so like, first preseason game was in Buffalo. I was there for that game. So was and, Larry Mayer, by the way. Yeah, exactly. You want an autograph? <laughs> no. He he rolled out, and he he had pressure on him, and he. Jumped up in the air and threw the ball about 45 yards downfield into triple coverage. And I remember looking at my brother and I'm like, what the fuck? Just, <laughs> I'm like, come on, man. And it's, <laughs> but that's, that's who he was. Yeah. So to get it to this point, I mean, Justin Fields is like a rocket ship, you know, you want it to successfully. Here's that list no right doubt. there. He's so this, going up in the air. This is from an anonymous NFL player, not a Chicago Bear. Herb Howard is in our chat. Herb Howard has this confirmed. Is not a, this is not a Chicago Bears player. Oh, so it would have been QB3 because Josh Allen was number two. But, I mean, Pat Mahomes, Still. Josh Allen, Justin Jefferson, Stephon Diggs, Judon, Chris Jones, Kelsey, Tyreek Hills, Darius Smith, C.J. Gardner-Johnson, Saquon, uh, Honey Badger, Darius Slay, Marshawn Lattimore, Micah Parsons, Alvin Kamara, number 17, Justin Fields. That's impressive, man. Yeah. I'll listen yeah. to that guy before I listen and it's to not like it's, it's not like that guy who had like a uh, was like a contrarian and had this list of 20 dudes who don't belong. I mean, right, that, that was right. that's a legit top 20. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I never liked that, uh, Ryan, the top 100, because I felt like certain players – on the Bears, I knew were deserving that didn't get into the top 100 at points. But it's still a great showcase of how he's viewed league-wide. And there's no questioning the kid's talent. He did something, albeit I don't know what Getze is either. I do not know who he is as an offensive coordinator. But there's nowhere to hide this season. For him, the offensive line coach, and the quarterback, and the head coach, and the head coach. So you know that's a big. That's a big. I well, I guess it's gonna sound like an oxymoron. That's that's a big story that's not being talked about enough, in my opinion. Is Lou Getzey exactly. because he's a given. He had a, he was bulletproof. Everybody. He was bulletproof last year. What's he supposed to do with an offensive line like that? What's he supposed to do with a young quarterback? What's he supposed to do with wide receivers who barely belong in the NFL? Well, now you're going to see Luke Getzey call and plays with a very good offensive. I think the offensive line has a chance to be very good. If Braxton Jones takes the next step, Darnell Wright is who we think he is. Uh, Nate Davis is a, is a legitimate oh top-tier offensive guard. Cody awesome. White here, 
for whatever people think of him as a center, he's a massive improvement over Sam Mustafer and Tevin Jenkins. Just play yeah. like he played last Stop year. Stop right there with the center, Brian. I, I had this conversation with cars earlier today. Not a lot of people are talking about it. Let's just say Cody Whitehair is mediocre to average. That's a monumental huge upgrade. Huge. And, and it, people will say that I'm crazy. That may <laughs> be more important to Justin Fields than even DJ Moore at the end of the day. You're that's how right. bad Sam Mustafer is. And and Cody White here is a seasoned offensive lineman. He's gonna be the captain of that group, playing yeah. right in the middle, calling out protections and everything. He is going to be a game changer both physically and mentally for what he brings to the offensive line, especially when you have a second year left tackle, a first year right tackle, uh, you know, left guard who's what Tevin Jenkins one of his third year, still young players who need to need that veteran to lean on that voice right in the middle of the offensive line. Sam Mustafer wasn't cutting it. Um, so I, the offensive line is going to be significantly improved wide receivers. We've talked about the running back room, which I'm sure we'll get into in a few minutes. I feel like the running back room is improved as well. And you know, Justin Fields is developing. So what's the system going to look like? What's the play calling philosophy going to be like? Are you going to let Justin Fields get into a rhythm? Are you going to run, ride the hot hand in the backfield? Like, what is he going to do with talent that can function? Right. That is so we'll crazy. see. That's that's why we do this network, this show, and have people like you on, because I I think it's important. I really do, and I'm glad you emphasize that because I stay awake. I I'm always the guy, the voice that some people are going to just take and laugh at because I'm so fiery and emotional about Sam Mustafer and Charles Leno. But then at the end of the day, it's become a universal thing when I've been saying it since jump because I get so fucking pissed off that this team is playing politics over performance, and it just becomes so emotional for me because that shit just wouldn't happen under my watch under what we were taught and, and it just gets so upsetting to me. And that's why this network well, even exists because I was so Phil, to just to bring up yeah. Brian's point from earlier about how, you know, an NFL draft media will put things out there and then fans, it's no different than when we had yeah. Olin on here and when Olin was preaching on Sam, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I get it. Sam's probably a great kid. I've never met him, but but Olin was talking about him as a top 15 center in the NFL. That's not the case. It never was. That's fine. He's still unsigned. If he was a top 15 center, the Chicago Bears could have brought him back on a minuscule deal. But people hear Olin say that and believe it. Well, Olin played in On the league. this network. Me and Olin debated no, that's what that. I'm, that's and what that's... I'm saying. To Brian's point, it's yeah, it's a, it's along the same same line. Well, yeah, he was an NFL center, so he knows. Well, it's listen. Just because you played in the NFL, just because you were a former GM, doesn't mean that you're always right. Doesn't yeah. mean that they it have misses, that... just like we have misses. And listen, we. We kind of, it, it, I don't understand how you can sit down and watch Sam and say, hey, this this kid is doing what he's supposed to be doing. And then you can't base it on contract or what the guy across him is getting paid. If you're out there, fucking play. Remember my dad good watching enough. tape on Sunday? You First it was Leno. And, and my father's like, are you kidding me? Like, you can't win with him. You cannot win with that. And then Mustafer, you can't win with this. Is worse. This is your center has to create. You're running zone inside or out. You have to get movement off the line. You can't be in the backfield and try to run inside zone. It's just yeah. not. And it's a it's a dangerous combination to play a young inexperienced center with a young inexperienced quarterback. Yes. You know, a lot of times the quarterback will. You know, the quarterback is the um is the guy who um takes all the blame maybe processing is slow didn't read or pick up the blitz or didn't see the right, I, I identify right. or diagnose 
the center has just as much of a responsibility to be able to identify what's happening in front of the offensive line pre-snap and assist those teammates of his on the left and right to make sure the protection for Justin Fields is as strong as it can be with their responsibility. Sam Mustafer might have been a smart dude, Notre Dame kid, but when you're young and sometimes you learn through the experience of getting the game reps, and it's fine if you have a young center with a grizzled veteran quarterback who can do the heavy lifting for you, but when you have two guys who haven't seen enough snaps to function at a high level, you have, they have no one to depend on. So be giving um, Justin Fields the gift of a veteran center like Cody Whitehair is going to be huge, even for his for his development as a player, as a quarterback, as a processor, as everything for everything. So that being said, Brian, like when they when the Bears were on the clock at fifty three, I was there I'm like go. you, got, you got to take Schmitz here. Yeah, that's that that's idea. that's where I was. So what was your you're on the same. Yeah, Same so it's going to sound like very contradictory here, right? Because I'm going to yeah. say, yeah, I was, I was thought the value at that yeah. point, uh, a center like that who, you know, pre-draft, there were some legit first round grades on him. Uh, I think that its centers have kind of become like running backs of the offensive line. It's just a matter of positional value. Interior offensive linemen tend to slide into that day two, early day three range and become long term starters like the running backs. Um, you know, Giants got a day one plug and play starter, right? In the second yeah. round at a critical position. But I think the Bears may have had similar conversations. And this is just me guessing mm-hmm. as we're having right now. Like we can't sure. go into this critical year with a rookie center. Like we don't know if this dude can play in the NFL level. We think he can. His tape says he can. Mm-hmm. He did great at the senior bowl. His measurables are fine. Checks every box, but we you just don't know until the bullets fly for real. Can they take a chance at such a critical position in such a critical year for Justin Fields as a center, a rookie starting? So perhaps that's why they didn't take him. But I mean, you could always stash him behind Cody White here for a year, right? You don't have to start him. Yeah. And to me, he's a dude that's going to be a 10 year player. He could be a 10 year all pro at center. And yeah, that's what you find in that round. So yeah, I was yeah. I was hoping for that, but I it's not the worst thing in the world to have Cody White here playing center. I think the only thing that was uh, more glaring than the need, in my opinion, there was the value. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we to all, me, it was a it's a perfect marriage. I'm like, oh exactly. holy shit. We I, thought I was right with you, however. <laughs> I would have traded two of the picks to move up for Foskey and get a pass rusher. I believe in Isaiah Foskey. Uh, That's what I would have done. But when the draft was falling that way, I was on either you're taking, if you're taking a defensive lineman, I wanted Thule from USC there or the center from Minnesota. Like we all had, he was my number one center as well. That was where I would. Instead, they took Jervon Dexter. So for me, we broke down the tape, me and my dad, this past Sunday, and we had a lot of fun looking at it. Him and um, what's his name from the third round defensive tackle. Zach Pickens. Just, Pickens, thank you. Totally had a brain fart. Uh, Pickens. You're almost 50, man. You're allowed to have that. <laughs> but it's clear Pickens just pops off the tape. He's, he's everything you're looking for in a three tag, and, and we'll go there in a second. But Dexter, there's outliers here because you're looking at traits and past history with him being a five star. And I don't even care about those fucking things, five stars and all that. Show me your tape, that then I'll I'll put a new star on you. That's how I feel on that shit. But it says that he was talented coming on. There's no, he's 6'6, 315. He's got some great traits. Was he in a, he's in a read and react scheme, but he's always laid off the ball. He's always, so that's the outlier with this guy. Is he going to get it, Brian, in your opinion? So this is a really good question because I heard somebody, it might have been on um, 
the Hogan Johns podcast. They had a round table with some guests, and he talked about the draft year uh, when the Bears drafted Ego Ferguson in round two and Will Fuller talking, in round three. Oh, it was, it, was, right? it, was, it was our guy, Herb Howard. Sutton. Oh, Sutton. Well, was it Herb? Oh, yes. it was Herb. So Sutton. they, and it was such a great point, and it brought back like, the PTSD of that draft year where I was like, and I actually wanted Will Fuller in the second round when they were on the clock and felt like, Oh, vindicated that he fell to the third round and they got him. You mean Sutton. And, Sutton. Yeah. Will Sutton. Oh, I, I say Will Fuller. Yeah. Will Sutton. Yeah. Um, Sutton. Yeah. Like completely different. Brain human parts being. around. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen, that's what happens, man. <laughs> Will Fuller would have been a fucking problem inside. Yeah. Of yeah. That yeah that's a problem. That's, that's <laughs> problem. Yeah. Um, so, Still would have been an upgrade at wide receiver for them. Yeah, he <laughs> uh, would have been. Yeah, but um, so here's the thing: I when when you listen to Ryan Poles talk after the draft and what he talked about, I thought it was really interesting because he gave you a little bit of insight into his scouting methodology. When he talked about big guys, you grade the flashes, right? You grade the flashes mm -hmm. of big guys like Jervon Dexter because you don't know from the outside looking in what the scheme is asking them to do. So the, for example, Phil, we'll use your, your, um, you know, red flag of he's always laid off the snap. True. Absolutely. He's not quick. He's not, he doesn't seem like that cat like reflex that you want that interior defensive lineman in today's game to have. But is he told to do that by Florida? Is he just said, hold your ground, basically just stand up like a slug. It certainly sounds like that's what he's been coached to do there. And what Ryan Poles warned against was forming too much of an opinion on those moments and instead grade the flashes. So how I interpret that is when he does make a splash play in the backfield, when he is getting after the quarterback, just isolate that play. And is that play, the traits he displayed on that play, the athleticism, the length, the strength, the read and react skill set, is that something that if he's told to do that <clears throat> on a consistent level in the NFL – will make him a high-level second-round player. That's up for debate, right? Zach Pickens, yeah. I again, I agree with you, Phil. I think when you talk about juice, like for me, one of my most important traits, qualities in a player that is asked to basically go somewhere with the ball or get after the ball is juice. How quick are you, those first three steps, because that's going to make it, that usually decides successful play or a failure. And Zach Pickens, to me, has that juice, another five-star kid, right? Not a great career at South Carolina, but he might be a better pro than college player. If you look at the yeah. second day, the Bears draft picks on the second day, they clearly valued their recruiting pedigree because all these oh, guys yeah. were top great. dogs coming out of high school. And pace, you look at the Raz scores, the athleticism, they clearly had an analytical profile that they were targeting with players this year they had to be high-level athletes. We don't care about college production. We're going all the way back to when they were in high school. What? Where did these kids stack up as they've come up through the football ranks? And we trust our coaches. We're getting a player who has all the raw ability, has had it since he's 18 years old, has the athletic ability. All these guys grade green on RAS score, so they have the athletic ability, played high-level competition. You got Florida. South Carolina, Miami, Texas. We're going to bring him in here, and we trust our coaches to get the job done. And that's what's happening with this draft class. It's either going to be a friggin' unbelievable strategy, or it's going to yeah. blow up in his face. Yeah, because you know there are. I don't mean to interrupt you guys, but there is like you don't want a box score scout, right? Everybody says, "Oh, you're just reading the box score," and that's a hundred percent right. That can't be. If you look at a pie chart and the slices, it can't be a big slice of the pie chart. Mm -hmm you want to see a football player fill up the stat sheet too. Like they should be making plays, absolutely sacking the quarterback or defending right. the pass or chewing up high yards per carry. If you're a running back production does matter. You can't just look the part. You also have to play the part and production usually, usually will tell you part of that story. And none of these guys on day two were super productive. So that is a little bit of a red flag. Yeah. And you know, I think one of the things that we have to keep in context and I understand, I understand with with Dexter, he was averaging 55 snaps a game at Florida. It's not gonna. What is he gonna get here? 25, right? 30. So when you're talking about grading the splash plays, when you're condensing it more, it's it's gonna be interesting because you're right. There's there's a a lot of projection there, 
but they're basing it off traits. And I mean, even his, the Florida defensive line coach said, Hey, there's no doubt that he's a much better fit in the system that the Chicago bears are going to be running for him where it's just go than mm-hmm. what we had him doing at Florida. That came from his defensive line coach. If he was a lazy guy that they didn't believe in, like the Georgia coaches with Jalen Carter, he's not going to come out there and defend the kid. You know what I mean? Right. right. And we're going to know real fast. We'll know real fast with Jervon and preseason first couple snaps. It's not going to, it's not going to take long to know if he's a dude, if he blows up the center, blows up the guard, first couple snaps in the first preseason game, you're going to see if he doesn't flash the juice when he's told pin your ears back and go, we know now there's no scheme restrictions. He's not being held back. Exactly. He's going to be told and just go. And if he doesn't flash that juice, that's a problem. And I know this didn't, this part of it didn't work out with Will Sutton and Ego Ferguson. I think it's a great comp by, by Herb too. But if you look at Will Sutton as a junior, he fit the profile and then they had him bulk up and it, yep. it totally took away from his game. This is where I think it's a benefit when you bring in these two guys. Cause listen, if you want to go back a little bit further, you can go with the TNT duo inside with Tommy Harris and Tank Johnson. Tommy they've Harris done they've done the, they've done this before. But when you see a guy, you see Zach Pickens exploding off the ball. When you have your buddy there on the interior, if they're lined up with one another, that part of it to me matters. When your rookie counterpart is lined up next to you and you see him bursting off the ball, you get some of those competitive juices going and they can work off one another. I'm not saying that he's the the perfect prospect, but I I I think there's a lot of layers to Dexter other than he's just you've just you've lazy. also heard I I was catching up today, I'm not gonna lie. I think they they're doing some better things that Shane shared with me, the scouts. I'm talking about the Bears media department, but yeah, they did they that today. Do, they didn't do enough with these guys as to get to know them. But the the interviews that they did have after camp, you especially from um God, am I gonna do this again? I'm forgetting his name. <laughs> Zach Pickens. South Carolina. Pickens. God, how am I doing that? Let's call him Pickens. Pickens. Uh was talking about his texting him, them traveling together in the circuit, going through the whole pre-draft visits and all these. And, yo, big fella, we're doing this together. So to your point, Shane, it's already starting that these two have understood the mission of what they're going to be. And Shane also, Brian. All right, to Tyreek Stevens and and the, the wide receiver from Cincy that we took. Mm-hmm. Same thing. They've been working out. Yeah, I didn't together I didn't hear yeah. that part yet. Yeah, but the thing that Shane pointed out, and we played it again for my dad on our patron show, X's with the O's, was the Bears college scout uh, director, whoever I, I forget his name. Once he got on the phone, Shane pointed out it wasn't "What's up, man?" It was "You ready to come here and hustle?" Was oh, what yeah. he said to Dexter. And that, to me, is what excites me because it, it there's nowhere to hide. Like Brian said, I'm going to know right away preseason game because I have no – even... I, I see loafs. Uh, is it because he's playing 55? I've played the game of football. I know that you got to be in shape. you got to be in condition. you got to take it serious. This kid was living off talent, and he's strong as shit. So he's he's going to be able to overcome stuff. So if he gets his mind right, if he does, because I look at what we talked with Travis Bell on our show. If tra- tra- No one's even talking about Travis. They're not doing anything about Travis Bell except Ryan Pohl saying one of his favorite people. That shit just gets lost by the Chicago – they mentioned the two tackles. They don't mention him. And he fucking explodes off tape. He never quits. So your peers kind of set the tone for you. So if they're all moving in unison and you've got the right culture, like my father said, 
when we watch the Dexter tape, I have a lot of concerns. Standing straight up, getting double, moved, moved, moved. There's no excuse for that. Dip your fucking pad, deliver the blow, and read and react with your strength. Sometimes he gets terrible plays on it. Then he's great. My dad, get him in the NFL, coach him up. This kid could be a superstar. And that's where we're going to be, Brian. Yep. You're 100% right. We're, we're seeing Raz score trade. 6'6", 315, 48840. I mean, <laughs> Michael Strahan. What was he? 6'5", 275, ran a 4'9", right? 4'8", for an interior defensive lineman that big, that strong. Dexter is strong on tape. That's the one thing. There's no doubt he's got some country boy strength. And he could throw people around. So hopefully he does what he, he does. Uh, but watching Pickens tape, <laughs> One of the fans said it, Brian, on Patreon. I'm, I sh Ivan did a great job cutting this play that I was hoping it was there. And it's a bubble screen. And they throw it out to the left. And the receiver comes all the way back, goes this. Pickens is running the whole fucking, like, he's a linebacker. He looked like LeVon Kirkland back in the day. You know, a big, burly linebacker running. I mean... I'm so excited about Pickens that I really believe this kid is going to be your three technique stud. Like I believe yeah, and, in and, his and, personality too. And we we can't overlook the Demarcus Walker signing is one that doesn't get enough oh, yeah. love too. He's not a star. I agree with it. But that dude's a tone setter, right? He's going to punch people in the mouth and he's going to yes. collapse the pocket. And Heavy now you're hand. talking about adding three new defensive linemen into a rotation who are a blend and of billings billings yeah, exactly exactly He's so you added a lot of fucking strength power yeah violence to that defensive line it's a completely different group it's almost like the transformation of that wide receiver oh, yeah. even though wide receiver has a little bit bigger names but it, but it pushes everybody down to where they need to be you know what i mean you bring Exa in D exactly right dj Moore. it pushes darnell mooney down it exactly pushes right chase Cl claypool down and that's we haven't even mentioned justin jones i'm not saying that he's a world beater but he's he's a he's more good. than serviceable he's a good defensive player. lineman yes he is you get him with some other talent yeah exactly that how important is that on a defense it's every, the hardest position to transfer to the nfl isn't tight end or quarterback to me, it's always been defensive, interior defensive lineman. Because if you were a stud, it's that wake-up call. <laughs> These motherfuckers, they could be country boys looking sloppy like five whoppers in. But they have technique and blow your ass off the ball real quick. And you're, all your athleticism, all the things, you, they go by the wayside. Look at how many defensive linemen are drafted every year that aren't in the league after one year. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's the hardest. And it's you know you're going to see the snapper. you're going to have uh, fresh legs all the time too, which is huge. That's a huge yes. advantage, especially when you don't have such a drop in talent from the starter or second teamer to that third guy that might be in. You have a lot of high upside players who are going to be rotating. You're going to have fresh legs on that defensive line in every key situation, which is huge. You know, the offensive linemen don't have a chance to do that. They're, they're, they're banging heads every snap on offense. Exactly. If you have each of these defensive linemen, 33%, 40%, 25% of snaps, when they're in, their ears are going to be pinned back and they're going to be playing with their asses on fire, which is huge. That's huge. So, We'll see. I mean, I think Jervon Dexter was not a name that was popular in draft Twitter. He wasn't a name that you heard Todd McShay or Mel Kuyper or Daniel Jeremiah talk about before the draft. He wasn't a, he wasn't a guy in the run-up to the draft. So every And every year that happens, you have a guy or two or three who come off the board in the top 50 or 60 picks that – you know, you have to run to online and kind of do some research. Oh, what was his combine score? What because you're not focusing on these otherwise day three names 
And here he is a top 50, almost a top 50 pick. So the knee-jerk reaction is to be critical of the pick. But when you look at the Bears' overall draft class, and what I try to do after this year's draft, because it's only Ryan Pohl's second draft with the team, and it's really right. the first with his philosophy in an entire offseason of rebuilding blueprint, it all makes sense, right? You have high character, high-level athletes whose best football is ahead of them. I mean, almost every single one of these guys, you could say that about. Uh, even so, I, This is one of the first draft classes in a long time that I'm sitting here looking at this name of players, this list of players. I can't pick out any one of these guys who I don't think will be on the active roster. Every one of these guys to me, Maybe Kendall Williams and the safety that compensates with the last pick of the draft or second to last pick. I don't know if he was 258. The Bears didn't have Mr. Irrelevant this year. Did no, they? the pick no, before. They had the yep, second, second to last. last. You're right. So he was the second to last pick of the draft. He might have a hard time, but every guy on this list, Darnell Wright, Jervon Dexter, Tyreek Stevenson, Zach Pickens, Roshan Johnson, Tyler Scott, Noah Sewell, Ter Terrell Smith, and Travis Bell. They're making the team. They're they're I on agree. the roster. I agree with and you. That, that is a totally really agree. hard thing to do to come out of a draft class and look at every player pulls his first draft. There was a couple of day three offensive linemen that you knew that they're probably not going to make practice squad guy. Maybe right. Every one of these guys I think is going to be on the opening day roster, whether it's rotational player on offense, rotational player on defense, critical starter on one side of the ball or critical special teamer. That's a great draft. It is. I hear you, man. And what, what, just one more thing on Dexter in the 21 years old. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's you know, right. It's he's not even a man yet. Yeah, it's I just there's like I said, I think you just have to be cognizant that there's there's a lot of layers to a guy like this. And it's not it's I know it's hard to say because where the tape never lies and you're it's obviously on tape. Everything that we've seen on tape is not perfect, but you can't sit here and say that there's not projection involved in the NFL draft process, because if that were the case, you'd never draft a quarterback. Very, very, very rarely you would ever draft a quarterback. But you there's have, you have that? moments on his tape. Listen, there's nobody I trust more than my dad. He came away from Dexter's tape saying, Phil, this kid, if he buys in mm -hmm. and you have the right coach on defensive line coach, there is so much there to get this right, that he will be a dominant football player inside. He's got you know, too so much strength. I see some yeah. of the comments saying that it it also proves that you might, I guess my my projection that all these guys will make the active roster, it also proves the state of our roster from last year. But I, again, I don't agree. Because I no. think every one of these guys would be on an active roster in the NFL next year. Oh, like, I, I see think every saying. one of these guys is not only going to be on the truth. To, to that too because that defense looked like a hot knife through butter. But like let's look, look at round five. Noah Sewell. Okay. He's making the roster. Which of the 32 yeah, teams him. Draft him. He's yeah. making the roster on yeah. You look at Tyler Scott. I loved him. Any one of the 32 teams draft him, he's making the final roster. Terrell Smith, yep. the cornerback from Minnesota. Yep. Any 30 any he's making the roster. These are NFL I players. So, like nice if you pick. look at this group, Travis Bell might be the only player that you could say, huh, that's a pretty surprising pick. First player ever from his school to get drafted. But he's going to make he's going to make this team like he's going to make it. And he would make a lot of other teams in the league. So this group of players, this is not a like a list of like the offensive linemen who I even remember some of them that were drafted last year that didn't make the team because maybe they weren't that good. Some reaches yeah. trying to fill plug some holes. Every one of these prospects that is now on the Chicago Bears is a rosterable NFL player. And the way you build good teams is by having good depth, building through that day three, those day three picks, and hoping you 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 catch a star along the way, a star or two starting a quarterback. So I disagree with some of those comments. This team, this group of this list of players drafted by Ryan Poles are active roster guys in 2023 across the board, across the league, not just on the Bears roster. Yeah, and I think one of the things, too, that we have to remember, too, and this is what people fall into the trap, especially on, on Twitter, there's no middle ground with any player. It's either they fucking suck right. 
or they're superstars. That's there's no there's no middle class, and that that's what I always laugh at. You know, people are like, you know, the the the, the offensive line's got to get better. The the wide receivers got to get better. They're never talking about internal improvement from Justin Fields, from a, a Tevin Jenkins, from a Braxton Jones. I mean, you're talking about year two in the same system. That's that's a huge deal to any player. You go from having to overthink about what you're supposed to be doing just to it just being ingrained. All right, I know this. I saw this. Boom. That's a big part of what's going to be the Bears' improvement. It's not just adding to the talent base. It's being in this same system a second year. That's a, that's a big deal. 100%. I, and I will back up, Brian. I believe what, what he's saying. I mean, the kid from Kennesaw State that we interviewed last week, Travis Bell. I mean, well, I have his tape, so putting together that for our patrons to see. And it's just, it's there. But then you see him, and I think Ryan Cox said it, in a, it like read my mind in a text thread, one of those group tech you see the thighs on this kid <laughs> like he's got so much power in his lower half you get defensive linemen like that young hungry has had he's missed a few meals in his life right you get those type of guys on your roster that play hard and love this game of football like he does there's another one. I was totally asked the same question at work today, and I said the same thing you did. I go, the only guy I worry is the last pick. I don't know about if he'll make it based on all of the players we already have on this roster, or will they pick somebody else up? Still have a practice squad to fill out, too. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, you talk about Travis Bell. Like, yeah. a lot of times teams for uh, player uh, fans forget – that when you take a small school guy who has the traits and you put him into, and, and we're not just talking small school, like, you know, small program that's never playing for the national championship, but they're the FBS level. We're talking small school football. Like Arkansas. You, you go into, a, you go into their weight room, their strength and conditioning program, the yeah. facilities they have to build their body. It's almost non-existent. You put this kid, you stash him a year or two as a reserve with pro coaching, uh, strength and conditioning. He's based on the Raz score, six foot three ten, almost thirty three inch arms. He's like the new normal at the three ten, right. the Aaron yeah. Donald looking guy. And you you transform his physique a little bit because now he can focus as a full time career as a football player. We don't even know right. what this guy's capable. He Phil. You're right. He could end up being better than the second and third rounders on this roster. It yeah, happens no, all it, the time. It, it has, happens all I the time. I told him the story. He didn't even know who John Randall was, who was undrafted because he was small. And John Randall was from a small school, Texas A&I. And that bias goes a long way. I played with a Pro Bowl wide receiver named Wayne Krebet. It goes a long way when you get there and say, I love this game and I'm better than everyone and I'm going to work harder than everyone because I missed meals. I don't, I didn't have NIL money. I didn't have a fucking team charter bus feeding us fucking McDonald's breakfast on the way to the game or. Or, or stopping at the fucking Waffle House before. I didn't have shit. I worked three jobs. You know, that shit matters. And yeah. I'm excited about that let me, kid. Let me break it to you, bro. These guys ain't eating McDonald's breakfast either. <laughs> exactly. they're, going, they're going a little higher end than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I flew with the Bears. You walked on the, on the plane, Brian. And they just handed you uh, Chick-fil-A Chick -fil sandwiches. Like right when you're walking, do you want uh, nuggets or sandwich? I go. What? Yeah, it wasn't on you're Sunday. Stupid. That wasn't right. even what you're yeah. eating. <laughs> that wasn't even what you were eating. Then they give you a full meal. Then they're coming around with fucking dessert. Do you want candy, Mister Toshin? Would you like some Skittles? They, 
guy brings out a fucking tray of candy like he's at in 1950s at the movie theater. It was crazy. <laughs> but again, that's how they're getting treated. To your point, someone goes in there and shocks the world. I, I, I'm excited about him. I'm excited about what you talked about. His first play of preseason. Yeah. What do you what got? Let's talk about Rashawn Johnson running back. His story at Texas sitting behind an, an elite, we'll say, running back, obviously taken in the top 10. I had him as the third best player in this entire draft, Bijan. So here's his story, and he goes to the Chicago Bears, probably the most storied franchise when it comes to running backs or linebackers, we can argue, that the greatest ever to play, Walter Payton, obviously, Rashawn Johnson, one of the scouts went out there, Shane, and said what? Called him what? Say again? What did one of the Bear scouts describe to Rashawn oh, Johnson? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, City. The, the scout called him a franchise pillar for this Fran- organization. A fourth-round draft pick. Pillar. And I said, what made what made me laugh was, and I'm not trying to throw Ryan Poles and the group under the bus, and I know they wanted to recoup that fifth round draft pick but when you're talking franchise pillars i'm not moving off a pick i'm not moving off the first pick of the fourth round if that's how i have this guy mark <laughs> and i'm not taking a fucking chance so that that part made me laugh but no i was that was you know the day three you're a little bit tired from the first two days that one that one got my energy up a little bit when they made that uh made that selection and you can say whatever you want about Khalil Herbert, I was a fan of the Deontay Foreman signing. Travis Homer, those guys. To me, this kid, he's going to be the starting running back for the Chicago Bears earlier than uh, rather than later, I feel like. Yeah, I have uh, – Roshan's an interesting study for me because – it's difficult when you're such a big, he's a big back. He's got a big, mm-hmm. uh, you know, six foot plus six, two, two twenty. You don't expect those guys to have the wiggle quick feet necessarily as you right. would for a guy that might be five ten, two ten. And my preference, my eyes, we saw, we talk about like, trust your eyes, right? My eyes and my running back preference is usually, you know, about five ten, two twelve to two fifteen. And it all goes from the ground up, the footwork, how quick are their feet, how patient are they behind the line of scrimmage, plant foot and go. And having a little bit of that hip flexibility in the open field, being able to make a guy miss, run a good pad level, pick up the extra yards after contact if needed. Roshan's kind of the opposite of that. He's more, he's a violent runner. He does run with good pad level. He clearly is going to move the pile. He's strong. He's new to the position. Right, he's relatively new right. to the position, so I think part of that lack of natural fluidity for me when I watch him is just again reps. It's a reps issue. He's not only new to the position, but he didn't get the le- number of carries that a starter would traditionally get because right. he's behind Bijan. So I feel like I have to see him actually be able to consistently find the hole, hit the hole, get to the second level in the NFL before I can totally buy in. But when you talk about a player who's going to be hard to keep off the field because they, they do it the right way from a heart and mind standpoint, he's that guy. So Khalil Herbert or Deonta Foreman miss a block, you know, uh, fumble the ball. Like he's going to probably very early on in training camp prove to be the most reliable running back on the team the guy who's not going to miss an assignment the guy who's not going to turn over the ball the guy who you can rely on in pass protection he's going to give a hundred percent effort on every rep my only question is does he have enough natural running traits and we talk about juice the, the traits and the juice to be more than like a latavius murray type back in the nfl we'll, we'll soon we'll find out we'll see i do like khalil herbert I think Deontay Foreman is one of the most underrated running backs underrated, in the entire yeah. league. And he's the starter right now in my mind. He's if got it. I, I mean, was going yeah. to, 
Are you there too? I think Deontay because Foreman. Bears yeah, fans I mean, get all upset, Brian, when I yeah, say Foreman's, that. Foreman, he's just a better player than Khalil Herbert. I mean, I like Khalil Herbert. I think Khalil Herbert's yeah. perfect in the role that he plays. He is a he is if you if kind of what the Bears did: two series Montgomery, one series Herbert. Two series Montgomery, one series Herbert. I think Foreman slides into the Montgomery role, and Herbert stays as is. Right? Um, perhaps they flip it, and based on seniority on the roster familiarity with the playbook, the ability to flip the field like he's proven he can do. It'll be two – my lights go out here? It'll be uh, two reps, two series for Herbert, one for uh, Deontay Foreman, and Roshan works from special teams on up. Um, but I, I think, again, like right, we talk about preseason, you'll know real quick. First right. or second series with Roshan Johnson, you're going to know if this dude's an NFL back. I remember when Adrian Peterson came out. There was the yeah, obvious he was generational guy, can't miss guy. Everybody knew it. He was one of my highest graded running backs ever, Adrian Peterson. So there's never a doubt that he was going to be a Hall of Fame player. But I remember his first preseason game that summer, I believe, was against the New York Jets. And the first series he was in the game, he was embarrassing. Pro defenders. And you knew just after two carries, like this, this guy's going to be a Hall of Fame running back, right? Sounds ridiculous yeah. and silly. But, you know, we're, we're in mid-40s, almost 50. You've seen enough football when you know a guy's different. Roshan Johnson's not going to be different, but it didn't take long. Remember Matt Forte? His oh, yeah. first game against the Colts. His first carry was like a 57-yard run. He broke into the open field, made a cutback, boom, down the field for like 57 yards. Might have even been a touchdown. It was. You knew right away. Like, this guy's, this guy's got it. Like, he's got it. Like, you know, that doesn't just happen. So I think Roshan might fall somewhere between, and this is a great running back, Perhaps his ceiling is somewhere between a Forte and a Montgomery. Maybe a little better Montgomery was, not nearly what Forte was. Maybe that's being optimistic, but we'll see. I mean, character-wise, the story of him throwing away the water bottles and, and just doing the little things that separate leaders and culture guys from just guys who won't be around for a second contract, he's clearly displaying that, and that's rare. Like, I don't know about you guys, but Shane, you told the story, right, of what this area scout called him a pillar of the franchise yeah. potentially as a fourth rounder. I don't ever remember in my entire life of a, as a no. Bears fan or just a fan of football, a fourth round pick who is talked about as highly yeah. as Roshan's been talked about through it's rookie scary. minicamp. And well, it's 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 almost strange. It's you, it's, you talk about his was behind a. Well, that's my point. I don't want to say generational talent, but that's what Bijan is. I mean, you to me, that's a benefit. That's a positive for me because he's coming. If he's not behind Bijan Robinson, if he's he's playing just about anywhere, you know, in college football as a starting tailback, he starts over. Give you want to talk about what Khalil Herbert can't do. Roshan Johnson's the best pass pro running back that was available in the draft. He's he's got that already. I just I am a big big believer. This to me, this kid. It's I think that there's obviously I understand that he's got to yeah, show it, but Brian don't agree there. So it's, uh, you like Montgomery over Forte, without a doubt, without even a question. Forte uh, made a lot of business. I love you, Phil. That's a bad call, brother. <laughs> no, I'm on the other end but of that. <laughs> I, I'm not going to undersell the part when they're talking to the uh, teammates at Texas when they understand who Bijan was, but they also said that was Roshan Johnson's room. That, yeah. to me, it's that's, special. A, that's a massive statement. If that's you a get big a guy statement. like that with that talent, I know what Brian's saying. I see footwork and tenacity and toughness, great hands. I think there's a history of players. You look at the um, the kid for the Vikings. I totally lost it. Now he's with the Chiefs. He was a quarterback in college. The transition, this kid was a great quarterback prospect that decided when they needed help there that I'm going to go over there and play running back now this sunday my dad 
me and the, your boy, our guy, Matt Waldman, are going to break down uh, our guy Rashawn Johnson's tape live here on our TTNL network. And I, I guarantee people are going to go away saying, what's – thank you, Jarek McKinnon. People are going to – what is Brian Perez talking about? Look at this because I see some – some footwork on that Bijan level. Bijan had another gear that yeah. da David Montgomery didn't have, but they were like similar in their desire in contact balance and footwork in chaos. When you see those types of players, it's just outrageous because not the normal fan could understand what they're doing. And Texas's offensive line isn't that good. And for him to do what he did, and then watching Roshan, I mean, great hands. I would say Bijan is a better receiver, but it's not by much. It's not by much. So could they get a diamond in the rough here? Character-wise, I'm with Brian. I've never heard a fourth-round pick talked about like this. That it's getting me excited because I look at his tape, it gets me excited that maybe we got another David Montgomery guy that I don't fights for every down. I don't, I don't see, see that, Leo, Leo, at I all. I think you're going to see a complete different story when we watch the tape this Sunday. So if you're not a patron, get over there, become a patron as we break down the all 22 tape on Rashawn Johnson. Um, Brian, any other thoughts on Rashawn Johnson or that running back? I think Ebner's out. I didn't see practice anything squad. from Ebner. Yeah, um, Ebner's, but... Ebner's, I think we were Shane. I think practice squad is where he's ultimately headed. I also think, you know, listen, the NFL is a not for long league, right? So yeah. a guy signed like Travis Homer or even Deonta Foreman in March. You know, remember Mike Davis when he was the free agent signing and he made it yeah. only a couple oh, yeah. weeks on the roster? Yep. Some of these guys that we're excited about now, it's kind of, you know, the 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 ho the honeymoon will be over really fast and people will sober up from the offseason. And if Deonta Foreman is looks good, but they want to clear the way for Roshan and keep Travis Homer as well, because maybe he flashes more special teams upside because look. Roshan and Travis Homer on the active roster are almost like superfluous. Like that third running back, fourth running back, special teams is their primary role. I mean, you want, Travis Homer, if you want him to play that role, somebody above him in that top three spots, you could obviously do the three and four running back on special teams, but maybe Deonta Foreman isn't like a lock. I know it sounds crazy. I just said I think he's better in, than Cleo Herbert, but oh, this and happens every year. It does, and it's it's not like he doesn't have an extensive injury history. I mean that. Yeah, he's that, had a one year deal, a yeah. couple it million could be bucks. Homer, that's not making it, or Homer, yeah. exactly. One of those yeah, guys, I think, doesn't make the roster, and Ebner maybe kicks over well, the special teams because he was a Ryan Poles draft pick. And as much as I believe Ryan Poles has that integrity to just move on, he won't be like a Ryan Pace, mm -hmm. who Ryan Pace remember he couldn't let go of his guys. Ryan Poles will probably, if he had to decide between do I keep the guy just signed for agency or move the guy I drafted to the practice squad, he'll probably, you know, he he drafted Ebner for a reason. So, but back to Roshan for a minute. I, I you know, Leo made a comment. I think it was Leo saying the shift, the what have you. I, I think it all, you know, everybody sees the game a little differently, maybe. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can be looking at the same thing, but use different words to describe it. That's what makes scouting a very unique and sometimes like almost hard to master process because what he might use as shift, I might say wiggle, uh, you know, things like that. Right. Yep. But I think my issue with Roshan, it's not footwork in terms of like he's has efficient feet, which I think Phil might be more of what, where we see the same thing with him in terms mm -hmm. of his footwork is efficient not no wasted steps. He gets uphill fast and then he delivers the blow on contact. He delivers the hit. He doesn't absorb the hit, which is it's going to make bears fans love him. But that sweet feet, right? The ability to kind of dance a little bit and then hit the hole. That might be what Leo's talking about in terms of shiftiness. There is a little bit of that same question. I yeah, have. He's not a, he's not shady McCoy, right? That's 
you know, it's got those typewriter feet and it's going right. to find the hole. He's going to see the hole. He's going to hit the hole. And yeah, you know, I, tough, I, Shane? it's like yeah. when you're watching film or you're making a board or you're developing your rankings list, you as a scout or a player, a, a talent evaluator you have, it's like anything else in life. You yeah. have a preference, right? You sure. have a, a profile or a proto prototype that, oh, this is this is the kind of running back I'm drawn to. Mm -hmm. I was more drawn to a David Montgomery type of running back who I think has that sweet feet, yep. that ability to kind of his feet move a little bit quicker than Roshan Johnson's. That kind of running back, like uh, Javante Williams in Denver, the way his feet, 215-pound guy, his feet are like he's on a typewriter. That kind of running back or the running backs I tend to prefer, I don't see that from Roshan. But I could be completely wrong. I mean, again, we'll see. I, I'm cheering for him. I'm hoping he is the guy because yeah. that's the best way to hit on a running back is in the fourth round, rookie contract, home run. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. The the debates of this stuff is going to be fun. Oh, and, yeah. But I think, you know, people get caught up in this stuff. I just wait for people's shows like uh, – George Buns on the Run show, so I could see him. If you think I'm rating David Montgomery over Matt Forte because I have David Montgomery's phone number, that's just stupidity. I just see it differently, and Shane and I saw it. I just don't think Matt Forte wanted contact. He decided to make a lot of business decisions. Great athlete is he a great back yeah i just would have if i'm choosing the two of them on my team it's montgomery every day all day in fact the negligence of matt Nagy not doing what brian is questioning is getsy gonna do and i think it's very fair riding the hot hand the whole story would be different of david montgomery if the, i i'm certain he would have stayed here because he chose to leave. The same deals were on the table, if not more, from the Bears. He went to Detroit. You can hate him all you want now. But we all said. He might be rethinking that, too. <laughs> but, Just, but I was going to say, the upgrades the Bears made, drafting Darnell Wright, no early first-round pick running back to take those carries away. Yeah, Detroit has a better right. offensive line on paper, but his opportunity, if he stuck around, that he could have hit that middle of his career bracket really breaking through to the next level production was i agree yeah. phil listen there is no debate in terms of the love for david montgomery david montgomery in my opinion was like you say it's almost like he is what it sounds like when they're talking about roshan johnson that they're talking about david montgomery like David Montgomery's right. spirit and soul yeah. has been absorbed by Roshan Johnson because when David Montgomery would run with the ball, the passion he ran every carry with was contagious. And right. it wasn't a, a coincidence, in my opinion, that some of the most productive Bears drives were the ones when he touched the ball the most because exactly. everybody got fired up. Everybody on the offense would get fired up, and it would lead to they good results. They didn't want to go in the eye, Brian. He's going to be dangerous. That, He's going to be dangerous in Detroit, man. We're going to see. Dangerous. We're going to see. But, you know, it is a matter of opinion. And that's where this is fun. And this is where we love that, that stuff. Uh, Rashawn Johnson, to me, is a wild card. As much as he's unknown, there's so much excitement to it because we're going to know. And I want to go back to the comment. Like, we, we preseason, we were 3-0. and oh. We're talking about the only kind of C that you get. It ain't in practice against your peers because they're going to put rules and regulations just like they are on, the, on you fans using a camera. Hopefully they remove that bullshit now that Ted's gone. But when you get into the glorified scrimmage versus whoever we're playing in preseason, that's when you see the competition. I can't wait to hit and that's when you just know. So Brian pointing out uh, Adrian Peterson against the Jets in a preseason game, you just knew right away. I have so many moments where I knew Ego Ferguson was a fucking bust on the first fucking play of his preseason. I'm like, this guy, he it, it ain't the two-gap system. It's the he ain't getting a gap. He can't play. 
period. And, and that's how this game, and, and that's how it always will be moving forward. So you find out a lot. That's why when I see the Bears blog say, I'm going to read a book now, this preseason stuff, like you don't get it to the level that like every moment is important. Yeah, like NFL, like, like sometimes fans, rep. sometimes fans forget, and bloggers, content creators, what have you, might forget that NFL front offices are not just college scouting departments. Right. There's also a pro scouting department yep. where guys are charged with scouting XFL, USFL, CFL, and NFL. Like they scout these preseason yeah. games in the exact same way that scouts on the road go to college games. It's a little more convenient. That's how we got Josh to- Blackwell. Right, exactly. I mean, you yeah. have these guys. Yeah. You look at the, the the cut down day in the NFL. Terrell Davis. He was going to get cut. One team's trash could be another team's starter. There are even- some really good teams that have a lot of yeah. good depth and players that are they're trying to stash on a practice squad that if you have a good pro scouting department, you can snag some of these guys that can be long-term contributors to a roster. The preseason is essentially like some of these guys that are last year's practice squad players, maybe the year yep. two or three on the practice squad. They're trying to get that like master's degree in football to prove they belong on an active roster or just to make a team. It's no different. It's the highest of high level college scouting that a scout can do is to watch pros versus pros trying to keep their career alive. That is the, then, and you're not going to get a franchise quarterback. You're not going to get a starting left tackle from that. You're not going to get a 1300 yard running back, but you could get that one guy who makes that one big tackle on special Mm -hmm. teams because you watched the fourth quarter of a preseason game as a scout and you wrote them up. And your team brought them in. So those games are critically important. Like we lose sight of the fact that you have on the field at any one time in the third and fourth quarter of a preseason game, 22 men who are fighting for their livelihood. Like this is it. They have to make a play. They have to have that moment. And that's why when we talk about, we'll know right away in the preseason is because it is evaluation season. It doesn't matter if they... It doesn't matter wins or losses. None of that matters. It's an extension of a player's evaluation and roster construction. So if you want to have a role on a team, especially if you're a high draft pick, you got to have those splash plays in training camp and flash against another team. We'll know right away which of these rookies are head and shoulders. Now, there's development, of course. Some guys develop at a slower pace than others. But Ryan Poles, the one nugget, I try to learn something new about scouting every year. It's just my little personal evolution. What Ryan Pohl said this year is something I never, ever applied in any scouting report or process in any of the many, many drafts I've done is grading the splash, flash plays of the big guy. I'll Mm -hmm. watch a game. I'll write up a scouting report of the game. And there are moments where you're like, oh, not slow off the snap or not making plays, absent, motor runs, ah, motor runs. You just, you write up every play, grade those flash plays. And what do you, we can kind of filter that down even more and say, that's what the preseason is. Are they making a splash or flash play? The wide receiver making the one cut. Look, Jesper Horstead earned a roster spot because he had a huge freaking preseason game, right? He made some flash plays. Now, Another guy that maybe was ruined by the Matt Nagy era. Who knows? But totally was. Totally was. But I you have to. You, you have to see. Can a guy rise to the occasion? Because here's the other thing, and not to go too long on the soapbox here about this, but if a, you learn so much about a player's character, if they can rise up in that moment when literally everything is probably on the line, and make a play, that's a guy you're going to trust in a critical game situation at some point potentially in his career, yep. because if they can rise up and earn a contract on one or two plays in a third or fourth preseason game, that's a player you can build off of moving forward. So, Same you know, board. some of these blogs, some of these content Same creators, board. some of these people who say, Oh, it's time to go pop in a DVD instead of watching the third or fourth preseason game. By all means, go do that. It's, it can be very fu- It can be boring, right? It's boring. It's boring football. But if you love 
the art of roster construction and player evaluation, you know just how important that game is. That's why when the XFL or USFL is on, I'll always stop and watch a few snaps because those guys oh, yeah. are all trying out for the NFL. They're yep. not trying to win a USFL championship or an XFL championship, no matter what the talking points are online, whatever you hear on Twitter, all the social media outlets for these different teams. These guys have one goal, get to the league. That's why they're playing. And that to me is always intriguing, seeing the guys that are hungry. That's why I can't wait to see Travis Bell. That's going to be a hungry yeah. dude. Yeah. And one of the things that you, we have to remember too, Brian, is to your point with you know uh, pro personnel and these pro personnel departments and looking at other teams, it's an added benefit of having the number one pick overall. Number one in that waiver claim process. Oh, yeah. So you, got the first, you got the first dibs out of 31 other teams. Hell you can look yeah. at a guy and like we we we're projecting that this kid is not going to make the fifty three. We have to have this guy. There's not another team that can claim that kid over. What is it till week four? That's huge. You're up there. Yeah, it is. It, it it's very big. So and it should be strategically used by your GM, and it's going to be something that I'm sure Brian is going to be writing and talking about on Bears Talk, as well as us over here at the Tape Never Lies, recognizing the talent that's out there and before and i always say and maybe i'm i'm just who i am so you can love me or hate me but i don't have patience for somebody who has a bear's opinion and decides to go watch a dvd during it or go to the movies during the draft i just don't because i believe you have to understand the whole embodiment of it from the tape from the you know the stats as well as the the cap i always say fuck a cap because you can manipulate that shit no matter what but still you're going to have an understanding of it and understand the preseason is where it all begins to show it's like this is where the pads go on and you decide that whether or not you're making the team alex leatherwood you're asking about Alex. He he has a story that is great player bust. Alex Leatherwood, wherever he is, he could be listening to the show right now, has an opportunity to go into the fucking gym, get into a program where he's busting his ass, and all of a sudden, Tevin Jenkins is a nobody because Alex Leatherwood decided, I'm going to take my career. My body is my brand, and I am going to blow it up. It took this dude from Alabama, my guy, another guy that I loved, uh, Shane. What's his name? Now he lost his career, blew up like a balloon. There was no questioning his talent. And that now he's lost all this weight. He was at Alabama's tryout. What was his name? Yeah, it was. Tackle. Um... Oh, you know him, Brian. Offensive tackle. No, exactly. You're talking. About. I saw a picture of him the other day. What the hell yeah. was his name? In the charge oh, draft. Fluker. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. DJ Fluker. I love this kid coming out. God gave him every goddamn ability. He didn't have it up here. He didn't love the game. He didn't embrace the building of your body. I'm a Bears fan because there was a guy from Jackson State that said. I am going to do everything in my power to be successful. Never die easy. And that's the only reason why I'm a Bears fan, because of him. And the analyst that I am, because of him. So when hey, speaking I about DJ somebody... Fluker, DJ Fluker, speaking of freakish offensive tackle measurables, I remember this. I had to, I had to look it up remember to confirm Remember this guy? 36 and three-quarter inch arms. Yeah. It was crazy. Almost 37 inch arms. That's insane. He could have fit all that fucking yogurt in his mouth just like Phil did right there. <laughs> big I'm sorry, I gotta eat this. <laughs> I have to eat this protein snack before eleven o'clock. I'm on this special diet program now. I have to, it's a whole nother thing. So I apologize that I'm well, eating. Welcome to fifth to the top of your fucking class. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm getting old at 50. Like you said, I got to lose that weight. Albert Hainsworth, 
is the opposite of that. If Albert Hainsworth worked after he got paid, he'd be in the Hall of Fame. No doubt. He was so fucking... God gave him so much talent and explosiveness and power. Reggie White like power to just disrupt the backfield. If you don't work at it, that's it. And it's up to a coach to get that shit out of you. I believe that 100%. Eberflus, I don't know who this guy is. The handshake shit with Pat McCaskey got me nervous. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, no. <laughs> but I don't know who he is. I'm not saying he's – I knew Matt Nagy. I, re, I knew the reek before everybody. Eberflus, I'm – this is going to be his test. Same with Getze. How do you do it with Justin? How do you do with the hot hand? Don't fucking pull a running back out of the game after a 13-yard scamper where they broke eight tackles in it. Like, that's... The linemen are now getting juiced up, and then you bring Khalil Herbert in a minus three. Like, that stuff just takes the energy out, Brian. It just I agree, out. man. David Montgomery was a, was a, was a wasted... Four years in Chicago, some good memories for fans. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, it's, you know, players often end up succeeding or failing based largely on where they end up getting drafted, right? Talent oh, yeah. is only part of the equation. And I think David Montgomery, unfortunately, I had David Montgomery as the number one running back in that draft class ahead of Josh Jacobs. Me too. Me and too. Josh Jacobs blew up last year. So, you know, but Josh Jacobs blew up last year because he had an offense that committed to him. And he had a team exactly. that it's almost like landing in a different situation with Josh McDaniels getting there. If you have David Montgomery now in Detroit, he could easily put up, the, you know, Jamal Williams scored about 15, 16 touchdowns last year, yeah. whatever it was. You could see David Montgomery run for 1,100 yards and 13 touchdowns next year. And it'd be like, where, wh why? What? Well, 1,200 yards and 13 touchdowns, and that could have been in Chicago for the last couple of years. But circumstance sometimes results in missing that window for a player. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Brian, has there been a player that you thought no fucking way, and then he goes in there and he does, he surprises you with his performance? Oh, I have a guy... So let me hear your I guy have, as I kind of go through my mental roller deck. My here. guy was Darnell Mooney, without a doubt. I'm yeah, like, that's... Darnell Mooney looks so thin. I'm like, this kid, <laughs> what speed only gets you so much. Like to see his desire in the block, blocking game, stalk blocking, coming on crack. He blocks better than Cole Komet. Come at me, anybody. I will show you fucking tape. He will stick to you, drive his legs. They were leading. He lit. There was one play against the Giants, Shane, and I always brought it up. <laughs> he led up C-gap onto a linebacker and fucking planted his ass. I hadn't seen no, not one person, not one on that team do it. So he has been, and then obviously his ability to be at the stem of the route, you have to be a good actor and a dog. He is finally we have a dog. And that's why I believe he will get a contract with the Bears and they'll work something out because I think he's the kind of person you want to keep in this and building it with Justin Fields. He has been the biggest surprise I, for me. That That's my biggest memory of me saying a guy, I don't know. I didn't even know who he was. I'm not going to lie at the time. I was like, Oh, that skinny kid. I remember him at the senior. Yeah, Darnell, Darnell Mooney has allowed me to open my perspective a little more and give small, like slender receivers slender. Yes. a chance, right? Like the, like Devonta Smith was a guy who, um, or even coming into this draft class, a guy like Jordan Addison, for example. He's a first-round pick with the exact same measurables as Darnell Mooney, almost, almost exact. Yep. And I don't know if Darna Mooney didn't show the league that a 170 plus pound guy can have moderate to high level success as a route runner in today's game with the limitations of the physicality in the secondary. You know, it's, it's not that he has opened the door for this next wave of small receivers, but he is part of 
a cluster of receivers establishing precedent now that you don't have to be Megatron to win against yeah, NFL exactly. secondaries anymore. And, you know, this year's first round cluster of receivers was so underwhelming, I think in part because you didn't have, except for maybe Quentin Johnston, you didn't have that physically imposing uh, body type. You had a bunch of Darna Mooney's plus 10 pounds. You know, one guy, uh, Phil, that I think, I don't think it's necessarily a miss because I still had him as a as a late first round guy was Jamar Chase when he was coming out. I had mm -hmm. concerns about him separating, and I, you know, I got to go back and reread my report and understand even to this day how how could I have had that concern? But when he was running routes at LSU, and maybe it was because too, you know, he he was out of football for that year. It was yeah. in that Micah Parsons group of players that didn't play that final season. So you were kind of oh, a year yeah. and a half to two years removed and people grow fit. Like we just talked about Jervon Dexter being 21 people, two years for a 19 year old to 21 is a huge, huge okay. difference. Right. We all right. remember that, even though it was many decades ago for us, but uh, Jamar chase was a player that I thought wasn't going to have the same level of success he had at LSU in the NFL. I still thought he was a first round worthy receiver, but he wasn't. I didn't understand the top five hype he was getting. And that's just been completely blown up and proven to be incorrect. And now I think what the Jamar Chase experience has maybe enlightened me to a little bit is you really can't underestimate um, the value of reconnecting teammates on the next oh, level. Yeah. Like, what Philadelphia is doing on that defense with all those Georgia Bulldogs is such a unique, it's going to be fascinating to watch this group evolve together because if they become like this unstoppable force on defense and all that five or six Georgia Bulldogs are key starters on that unit, copycats are going to happen all over the place. Oh, yeah. And you could see runs of draft classes where teams come out of the draft of five guys from the same school if they're high-level players. Because that familiarity in the locker room, the transition from the college to the pro game, if you're going pro with a bunch of friends, that's a pretty good time, right? So Jamar Chase <laughs> caught passes at LSU from Joe Burrow. And then he goes to the league, and he's catching passes from Joe Burrow. There was like literally no timing issue. There was no acclimation to how a quarterback releases the football. Great it was point. like all it was. So I, I think that that, you know, a quarterback knowing where his receiver is going to be, before the receiver even knows where he's going to be inflates that separation a little bit. It creates more separation than maybe the route runner is creating on his own. Um, but still that could be me just trying to justify my initial take and not wanting to admit that Jamar chase is just a freak. And I missed on that one a little bit. Brian, what was your uh, thought process when the bears were on the clock at number nine and the enigma from Georgia was staring you in the face? Listen, man, I don't know what you guys think of Jalen Carter. But again, and if I went back after if I went back to the to the uh tape now with the Ryan Poles grade the flashes philosophy, maybe I'd have a completely different opinion on Carter. But I didn't see Warren Sapp. I didn't see Aaron Donald. I didn't see that guy. You're right there so, with us. Yeah, I mean I didn't see it. I, I saw a good defensive lineman who sure he's in that cluster of guys that are going to go in the first round, but this, this best non quarterback in the class, I didn't see that like from the start of the college season when right. he was like being talked about like that. And then when you add in all the character issues, um, I just would, I couldn't in my gut believe Ryan Poles is going to draft him. So I thought at number nine, he was just going to slide to 10. I didn't think the bears were actually going to trade back. I do feel like, a trade like that comes with some unnecessary risk for the Bears. And it's not because you missed on Jalen. It's not because you didn't take Jalen Carter. But And if you don't take Jalen Carter and Jalen Carter hits, it is what it is. But you, you traded with the Eagles. I mean, I know they were one pick behind you. But like, if you wanted to move back and you were going to take Darnell Wright, and chances are he would have probably been there. Maybe let maybe the going, Titans would have taken him. I, was going that, was, Titans. that was the word. All right. Yeah. So maybe they maybe there was a, is a moot point then. But it felt like, oh God, you, the Eagles got him. Like if he really does hit, the Eagles are going to be the NFC power for a while. And the Bears just 
helped get them a little stronger. So that was the only thing I didn't like about it. But I'm not sold that Jalen got Carter a fourth was, round pick out of it for next they, year. They got a fourth rounder, and it is you know that those picks they were going to pick. They were going to pick right, Brian. So I, I'm not saying that, that the Bears. Yeah, I'm not saying the Bears. Bears stayed at nine, took Darnell Wright, trade back, get a fourth round, take Darnell Wright. I get it. You get the same player yeah. and a draft asset next year. In the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, the Eagles end up with Jalen Carter. Yes, Eagles would have gotten him if the Bears didn't trade with him, right? Because he would have slid to ten, and the Eagles are there at ten. But it just feels like the if even though in reality this right was going to be out looking good though, Brian. What's that? Right now, I mean, did you see all the stuff going on yeah, today? I don't think there's. I think that's. Well, I'm not a Jalen sued. Carter fan, but I don't think he's being sued by the other family now. Well, yeah, that was that was always going to come down. I thought you were talking about the video and, then and the video of the yeah. blood, bloods or crypt, I don't think there's whatever. anything to that. I think that's just. I mean, they're bulldogs. They're all wearing red. You know, I trust. I really trust. Early, it's early, but I really trust uh, that Ryan Poles would not pass on a generational exactly. player. Yeah. So I feel like if he had him graded that were highly, he would not have made the trade. So clearly Ryan, uh, Ryan Pohl, and I, and I, what I mean by that is even with the potential character concerns, I think if he was generational great, mm -hmm. I think the Bears still would have taken him. So I don't think he just was graded that high on their board. I was with you. Shane and I were with you. We showed he was actually the first player we broke down back in – Jan it's very yeah the January, January. our yeah. first draft. Listen, you, the, show. there's we were, plays out there you can see where he looks like a fucking alien. You're like whoa, but then you don't see it. Exactly there's five plays that go by where <laughs> more just, than that. I mean, there can be twenty plays where he's just just a guy. And I who people, was the kid from Tennessee you comped him to? It was perfect. Played with the Jaguars as well. Oh. uh no, no, no. That's Kennedy. Uh, no, no, no. I wasn't comping him. I was, I, I was comping Dexter to him. Oh, Dexter to him. Oh, okay. yeah. Like well, John they, Henderson. They just John the, Henderson. Yeah. 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 <laughs> was the, yeah you I remember didn't those two guys? Those two guys, Henderson and Stroud in Jacksonville. It's yeah. kind of the same blueprint that you could look at what Ryan Poles did. With Dexter and Pickens, but yeah, I just Jalen Carter. I just think that there was listen. If you would have, if he would have pulled the trigger, it flies in the face to everything that they've been saying the entire yeah. time about culture building, hits philosophy. How did this is your first first round pick in your second year as the GM, and I don't know how you explain that to your locker room when. This kid is as big of an, an an enigma as he is, and like if 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 as a Bears fan or or content creator, whatever whatever you are through this process, if you're paying attention, and you see Jalen Carter can't even finish his pro day workout, yeah, right, and you know what the Bears value, right, and you then hear all the stories after the draft about how Darnell Wright finishing that that workout that that yeah. unbelievable like stress test that they basically put him through was a big factor in like pushing him over the top and making him their first round pick clearly jalen carter just didn't check the boxes and the minute he didn't finish that pro day you knew i, I felt like just the bears are not going to take him the i bears told are not gonna take i this sent guy. phil the the video <laughs> of that and i'm like dude it's there's no fucking way you can touch this kid just, I mean, just you're can't. you're gonna be you are going your your profiling is a top ten pick, yeah, and you have nothing to do but get ready for that one workout. You can't finish the workout. That means it's not. Look, I get it. He had shit going on in his life, and he had these the court appearance and the arrest and all stuff. That's not an excuse. Like you're in that position because you fucked up off the field, right? So like, right. let's be honest. You gotta too. be able to juggle. Let's be honest everything. too, Brian. It's not like he's got some fucking slouch as a as a as an agent either. He exactly. could have went. He could have went to Drew Rosenhaus and said, "Hey, my fucking head is not where it needs to be. We need to push this hundred percent, seven days, ten days." And I mean, Rosenhaus has got the fucking clout. 
Absolutely yeah. to have that happen. And it didn't. I mean, it's an epic failure by Jalen Carter. It's a fail failure by the Rosenhaus group. All of them. hundred percent. Brian, the receiver, Tyler Scott, that we took. Uh, what are your thoughts on him for the fans that wanted to know? So it goes back to a fundamental philosophy that I was told once I was at a pro day workout and a scout in the NFC North, I was picking his brain about a player and he said, plenty big enough, plenty fast enough Two two traits. That's all he talked about size and speed size or speed. If you have both great, if you have one or the other, you got a chance. Tyler Scott doesn't have the size, but he's got world-class speed. He's got a trick. So when I look at a draft class, especially day three, guys, mm -hmm. day one and day two, you kind of want to see more of a total package. But when you get into day three, the way I kind of look at this is, do they have a trait that you can't coach? Like it's either a super long guy, a dude, big dude, or athlete, speed. Tyler Scott has – he's going to step on the Bears practice field. He's going to be the fastest guy in the field. If that's the kind of – trait that is going to separate him in his quest to be a top four guy in the receiving pecking order. Um, I think he's got a lot of um, uh, Tyler Lockett in his game, the Seattle Seahawks yeah. receiver. I love him coming out. Kansas he was a second State. round guy. I think a lot of people projected Scott as a, as a second round pick, even a top yeah. 50 guy because of the Tyler Lockett comps. I think it's a very fair comp. You watch his Cincinnati film. I mean, this dude runs away from people after the catch. And it's one thing to create separation and maintain that separation after the route. You know, a guy's a good route runner and has at least comparable speed to the defensive backs that are on the field to maintain separation. The gap between him and the defender just keeps getting wider after the catch, which means he's just that much faster than everybody else around him. And that's, that's when you can kind of tell a guy has a different level of speed. When it's not only that nobody's closing on him, it's not just that he's maintaining that gap. It's getting wider as the play goes on. So he's that kind of rare speed guy. Like Darnell Mooney's fast as hell. This guy's a different kind of speed. Really? He's a different speed than even Darnell Mooney. And I think, um, you know, the problem is when you have a, you know, Daniel Jeremiah and uh, Bucky Brooks on their podcast often talk about when you build out a wide receiver room, it's almost like a basketball team. You have your big man, your point guard, your shooting guard, like different body types for different roles. So ideally, your top five receivers would each bring something maybe a little bit unique. You know, it's crossover, but maybe a little something unique to the table. You start seeing Darna Mooney and Tyler Scott. It's a little bit of the same uh, player prototype. But, you know, Darna Mooney's on an expiring, an expiring contract. You don't know. I mean, how's his injury? Is he going to have the same level of juice that he had before the injury? And if he doesn't, you know, Tyler Scott, you never it's know. Not, he could be a he's not tied guy to this front office up. either, Brian. What's up? He's not tied to this front office either. Exactly right. A hundred percent right. Khalil Herbert, same thing. Yep. That's why Jalen Johnson, another one. You know, Jalen yeah, Johnson. Big one. I, I think he's I think he's out of Chicago after this year. hundred percent. Yeah, I, I have a, a pretty uh, good source close to Jalen Johnson who said Ryan Poles is not even not even entertaining a contract to him right now. Play it out. That's how he's approaching it. And you take Tyreek Stevenson in the second round, a year after you take Kyler Gordon, you know, <laughs> drafting the right way is like chess. You got to be two or three moves ahead yep. when you build exactly. a roster. Exactly. This feels like a draft that's a couple of moves ahead. How big of a deal if – in your mind, is is Cole Komet going to get one? I mean, I, I get yeah, Cole Komet's a good dude. He's a nice guy, right? He's a good okay. fit I want to see where we – if we, me and you are on the same page, it seems like. So let me He's hear a nice guy. Got. He's a nice guy, but I wouldn't pay him top tight end money. I'd feel that. I, I keep even, rolling in the Robert Dunyans until you got your guy. I will – I don't know if you can ask around with your contacts, but will it be? Because this is what I believe should be. You play this guy out. Show me this year. I'm so tired of waiting for Cole Komet, and he continues to you know, run in a seven-yard out, and he jumps in the air to catch the ball every time, leaves his feet, never turns up the field. And then all of a sudden, he turns up the field and shows you it. 
I just have, don't see any consistency in the guy to warrant a contract extension that says you're a part of our future. I have not seen that on tape at all. And I wanted to see, you know, what's going to hurt him. What's going to hurt Cole Komet is the market for the tight ends is slowly coming back. Mm -hmm. Like regress. It's not as expensive. You saw that like Mike Isecki, some of these guys, uh, Dalton Schultz, they didn't get these big contracts in this off season. And you add to it the year before Cole Komet, like if I was Cole Komet's agent, I would have tried to get something done a lot sooner than right now because this year's draft class was like a historic tight end class. So you yeah. have a lot of teams that have just invested, you know, top 100 draft picks on a tight end. They're going to let those guys play out. Are they? You don't really think great? his team not investing there is a well? They did. Uh, the cap to him. Yeah. I, I think bringing in Tunyon was a little bit of a warning flare to Cole Komet because Tunyon knows Getzy. They he's. It's I not, think they're there's two not be totally curve. different. I think they're two totally they're different. They're very guys. different. They are yeah. very different, but I think it but also they are a lot them. alike. I, I don't think either one of them. I think the problem here is with, with tight ends in today's game is fantasy football kind of skews what you expect from a tight end. Everybody expects a tight end to, you know, have 900 yards and 11 touchdowns because that's Travis Kelsey and that's some of these other guys. He got spoiled by the era of Antonio Gates and all these uh, Tony Gonzalez, these big receiver like tight ends. You have Mark Andrews in Baltimore. Like to me, I was hoping that Cole Komet would develop into a Mark Andrews type because I think as from an athletic profile, a body type profile, they're very, very similar. But for some reason, I don't know if Cole Komet's ever going to get there. Is it because defenses have looked at Cole Komet as the number one target in a bears passing attack that fielded Dante Pettis at wide receiver? Maybe. And now you got DJ Moore and Chase Claypool taking all the coverage attention. And now Cole Komet can run these seam routes. And instead of seven yards in a cloud of dust, he's picking up 13 to 15 yards per catch. Maybe, but it's another prove it guy. And th- the problem here is um, you have Ryan Poles is not going to be able to sign off. So you got Chase Claypool, you got Darnell Mooney, you got Cole Komet, you got Jalen Johnson. I like that. There's a lot of guys competing for that money, right? There's a lot of guys on this contract, and it's not just competing for the Bears to show them love. It's they know they are entering free agency, and if they don't sign them, if they don't give them a contract now, they're going to go in the free agency. Uh, They're going to go to the regular season. You have a career year. You cash in. There's no more highly motivated player in the league than a player entering his free agent year. So if Cole Komet cannot look the part as a 23, 24, soon-to-be year-old, soon-to-be NFL free agent. It's never going to happen. So we'll see. Mark Andrews didn't break out till year four. Maybe it's coming. Yeah. I'm just saying, I think it's a, I think it's a position that just takes time. Shane and believes I'm not as, I, that more than me. I just don't yeah, see it. I'm not as down on him. I, I think uh, bringing in a guy like Tanya helps him do what he does best. I mean, Tunyon can be your guy that's going to make some plays. Tunyon has plays. much better hands. Oh, eye I, through that's hands. Why he, that's why he's here. This guy does gator claps. You don't, you don't want, you don't want to see Tanyan blocking. No, Tanyan can't block. That's what I'm either, saying. Either does Komet. He, he's Komet better, gets he's a better little blocker bit. than Tanyan does. He though. gets a pat. I mean, we, we could jump on some tape. I'll show you Mr. Komet loafing. Like a guy, like I wanted to go out in the, I, he would never play on my team. That's why, that's why I get passionate about guys like Mustafa, Leno, Komet. I just don't see the improvement. You know what I think? We could be looking at a David Montgomery next offseason experience all over again, because I think Cole Komet is probably very respected in that locker room, very respected mm-hmm. by Ryan Poles. Well, Ryan Poles is going to val- put a valuation on him. Yeah. Here's the dollar amount that we believe you are worth to our team based on production, based on potential upside moving forward, um, and all the intangibles you bring to the roster. Go test the market. And you might have a team that offers that money and maybe more of a featured role as a receiver with a more established offense, and Komet's gone. But um, I think you're looking more at something like that, where Komet, like Dave Montgomery, I feel like was valued – like all it takes is one team. The Lions got in there and they signed them. 
but Bears fans probably value David Montgomery as a running back much more than the average NFL fan, right? The average NFL fan is going to look and say it's an eight to 900 yard running back. Like what the heck, what are the lions thinking signing a running back in free agency? Bears fans know his actual value from a heart and soul standpoint. Cole Komet. I mean, Bears fans might, you know, overrate him a little bit maybe because when you compare him to the tight end landscape, you know, I feel like, for example, you see a guy like Pat Fryermuth, his stats are still catching up to his talent. But when I watch Pat Fryermuth in Pittsburgh make a play, another second round tight end, I could see that guy developing into almost like a George Kittle eventually in the league based on right. his after the catch. There's just that juice factor, right? I don't see it with commit. It just could again, like you said, Shane, tight ends for whatever reason. It's it's like I wish somebody could do some kind of study on on why. But tight ends take a lot longer to develop. It's been that we talk about scouting precedent, evaluation precedent. Yeah. It's clear as day. Tight ends take a long time to develop. Hopefully, commit can develop in time to earn that second contract and make yeah, all and of us impressed. And I don't think he's gonna sign some market setting deal either and listen let's be let's be honest he's he's an arlington heights kid grew up a bears fan if you don't think that they're going to use that in the process of this negotiation they're they're gonna you know what i mean they're gonna gonna use that as part of the the allure for him to stay here and to to take less i hope it comes after he's proven it i just don't see it right now I don't. Uh, I just think it's funny that everybody in the chat and everybody's praising Jesper Horstead as this unfound <laughs> gem that's gonna fucking blow up. Look at his guy. Look what he did. He's gonna be. He's gonna set the fucking league on fire for Vegas this year. But we're shitting on Cole Komet. It's to me, it makes no fucking sense. Well, it's very Jasper Horstead didn't get a good shot here, in my opinion. Well, what happened story. to him last year in Vegas? He he played, right? He played when what's his name got hurt. I saw him make some plays, but again, it's a finicky league. I mean, he's undrafted out of Penn State. I mean, uh, Princeton. Oh, I... This kid was a second round pick out of Notre Dame, and he just hasn't put it all together. I keep waiting for it. I hope it's there. Maybe like. You're saying Andrews. Yeah. I just haven't seen it to say let's get him. What, what I would Je- much what, rather right what, now. One of Jesper's Mooney. three receptions last year for the Raiders was your favorite. <laughs> I don't you want to pay him. It, it, it's just people are so fucking react. Everybody that's gone is the fu- it's they they made the fucking. I mean, come on, we're crowning Jesper fucking Horstead. He did. There was a miss. I'm sorry, Shane. There was a miss by Nagy not understanding the tea leaves of football that there was a connection with Fields and Horstead that was yeah, undeniable. They were both, and they they were both totally I understand. on it. They totally put politics in front of it. So again, I'm with you 100%. And the I'm Raiders saying. love the Raiders love Horstead so much. I mean, they drafted Michael Mayer also. So that was a good pick by the Raiders, by the way. I just I think it's Bears fans fall into this fucking trap of everything, everybody that it's you know, you see a guy fucking flash and have a nice touchdown. Listen, there's things to like about Horstead there. I get it, but again, there's no middle ground. If if you're not Travis Kelsey, you fucking suck. That's what pe- people fall into this trap. What how old is Komet? 23? I don't know. I think he's, he's, he's about 23, maybe turning 24 this year. And that's the thing. You're right, Shane. It's you're either a have or have not. And, and it's not turned, fair. He, he just turned 24 on March 10th. Yeah, it's not, it's not fair, especially when you talk about uh, the instant gratification of daily fantasy football and all that stuff. It really does factor in to how opinions can be shaped on skill players. Yeah. And Cole Komet is judged by, you know, a combination of stats and fantasy points. And yeah, he was and I never, get it. Listen, he was I get never, it. it was the same fucking thing when they drafted Adam Shaheen and gave him number 87 and called him baby. He was never Gronk. Mm. Cole Komet was never going to be Kelsey if you knew what the fuck you were looking at on tape. That they're t- 
totally different fucking players. Totally different players. I just, I, I think they're gonna. I think he's gonna get a deal in August. I don't think it's gonna be a market setting deal. Please, no, be wrong. I don't think. No, Shane. A- I think I would have. Ag- I would have agreed with that before we saw the landscape of the tight end free agent market. I think yep. that really, really hurt Komet's ability to maximize a contract right but, now. But that versus- might that might be why he also signs it right now, Brian, at the Bears number. To give You're him right. that security he could, now. Yeah. He could say, look, it could be worse next year, right? It could be yeah. a worse market next year. He but could, this is the worst time for him to sign. Yeah. Were you surprised I'm, the Bears didn't draft a tight end? I was. I was. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, it's it goes back to what you said earlier, Shane, about John Michael Schmitz, right? It's yeah. he, When you're talking about a roster, like this is I, – I heard – I don't remember where I heard this one. But what, when people are complaining, like Bears fans or analysts complaining about the Bears draft and – why they took this player instead of that player, this position over that position. I went into this year's draft saying like, they literally can't make a mistake. Like, I know it sounds crazy and almost like a little bears bias, but there were so many needs on the roster coming into the draft. If they took Christian Gonzalez as a cornerback in the first round and then, and then a tight end in the second round and then a running back in the third round, the draft class would have been fine because they need all these positions, right? They needed upgrades in a lot of different spots. Tight end to me is no exception. I think a tight end would have been a good selection. Again, chess got two tight ends on expiring contracts right now on the roster, Tunyon and uh, commit. And when you're talking about a draft class, that's rare in its depth of playmakers at the position, a position that's hard to find a real true playmaking tight end. Yeah, it would have been it would have been a smart strategy, not do or die. But again, like I love taking cornerbacks too, right? That's a premium mm-hmm. NFL position. You lock a guy up on a second round contract valuation for the next four years, who's gonna come in and start right away yep. as a rookie. Can't you can't argue a cornerback in round two? You know that's that's the premium premium position. They they landed premium offensive tackle position, premium cornerback position in the first two rounds. That's really how you have to, in my opinion, that's that's how you have to spend those early round picks. Yeah, look at the Bears' second. I mean, Poles didn't draft Jalen Johnson, second rounder. Jaquan Brisker, second rounder. Kyler yeah. Gordon, second rounder. Tyreek exactly. Stevenson, second rounder. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, crazy. Shane, yeah. The Jasper Horstead fans will be happy that – we replaced him with another Princeton tight end. Now we we picked up uh, Brown's tight end Carlson, well, former it, Princeton. Yeah, they did. But see, and this is another thing too that I think is important. I I thought that they would draft a tight end at some point because this class was so deep, deep. But yeah. people always think that the next is but the draft class next year always better. Next, you get to next year. It, uh, wait till next year. It's the same type of thing. Maybe this is a tip of the cap to Chase Allen, who everybody was fucking excited about as a UDFA last Good year, point. and nobody talks about him. It I gets back think. to my. It gets back to my internal growth. Part of it, tight end, is a position that it takes some time. He was an undrafted free agent last year, still on the team. They brought him back. Maybe maybe they see something in him to keep him around. And it's the next guy is not always better. And I think, you know, oh, let's bring in this rookie. He's going to – when we drafted Kevin White, everybody thought they had wide receiver one for the next 10 years. How'd that work out? <laughs> That's terrible. I will say the tight end from Georgia is – Bowers is a yeah. beast yeah, he's on a tape freak. watching. Yeah, if you, if you look freak. at the 24 – 2024 mock drafts, tons of them have Chicago taking him. Really? All right. I, oh, yeah. I would be in that yeah. market for Justin hitting that kid. That kid's the real deal. And I also thought that about Mayer, who went you know late in this. I was surprised he went in the second round, and the Raiders are going to get a good football player there. Um, oh, God. I wanted to run through some questions here for you um brian before we wrap up and let you go you've been so generous with your time talking ball dude all night man if you're just tuning in we got the great brian perez of bears talk brian 
Bears talk is new. Do you want to send a, a little? Yeah, man. We just, uh, it's funny. I remember before the 2022 draft. Yep. We had a yep. little draft show, but when we were off air, kind of chatting in your, in your, uh, in the green room with all that good food and, and coffee that you guys provide. Um, <laughs> You know, I told you guys kind of off air that Bears Talk was going to be launched at the time I was writing for another outlet, and this was kind of a project that was I was building up. So it's a little over twelve months in now, and it's been man, it's been awesome. The growth, the Bears Great. fans are a very dedicated group of, as oh, you yeah. guys obviously know, the growth of your brand has been freaking amazing to watch. And uh, Bears Talk is is uh, it's had a really, imp- I'm I'm blown away by how many clicks and people have followed along. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun developments over there as well. We have a couple things in development that should be ready to go by August that will make uh, Bears Talk a true one-stop destination for Bears fans. So I'm, I'm looking it. forward to announcing more about that in the future. You're not partner. You're not partnering up with uh, CHGO, are you, Brian? <laughs> no, man. You know, independent. <laughs> listen, you know, Phil. You said in the intro, we're 100 right. I've written for a lot of different outlets, and I feel like what has really helped me grow as a uh, you know content creator, whatever blogger, whatever term the beat writers tend to use as a as an insult, which I take pride in whatever term they want to use for what we do. Um, I learned a lot from a lot of different places, a lot of different mentors. And one of the things I learned most of all, which is what you guys have done with your brand is I want to be independent. I want to do my own thing. I want to be able to have my voice not be controlled by an editor or my yep. opinion not be um, told that eh, now somebody else is going to write that article. Somebody else is going to do that. So uh, staying independent and not having any kind of outside investor partner with a, another digital brand like like uh, you know any of these uh, media groups has been part of the reason why I think Bears talk has been able to grow as quickly as it has it's just a fun bear site you know there's yeah. there's no nobody I don't have to answer to anybody and uh, it's been it's been great so any bears fans out there that have been coming to Bears talk I appreciate you thank you you know I can't say enough I took a chance leaving the outlets that I was writing for. And I've written for USA Today. I wrote for NBC Sports. I wrote for uh, the Draft Network. You know, you get those paychecks every month. It's a great sense of stability and even a little security. So when you go out on your own, you know, you right. only eat what you kill, right? Right. And uh, the fact that the fans have been so great and the readers have been so great has really made the the risk, if you want to call it a risk, has really paid off. So I'm, I'm very oh, appreciative. It, it always it, is a risk. It's yeah, a testament, man, because it, yeah. it, it's daunting. When Phil and I left where we were, we we knew we had a very limited window to work with before the season started. We were out in July, and everybody knows when football starts. And it's it's a daunting task when you're – you're not answering to anybody. Every, you're making all the decisions and everything moving forward. And I don't think Phil or myself, and like with what you're dealing with, Brian, I don't think we realized how much there really was to it when you're just starting out. It's a it's a big project. And well, listen, I've I've yeah. you know Phil as, Phil, as you mentioned earlier, you know we've known each other for a long time, and Shane as well. And we did have that period over at Bears Wire, Phil, where we were really able to connect on just that fundamental Bears fandom level while we're each kind of finding our voice and what would be our space in this industry, right? right. And I always knew that you would be in, an, in a world like this. I even told you way back when. Yeah. Maybe it was a little hat tip to my talent evaluation skills, right? The scout. <laughs> I told you way back then. I'm like, man, you have to be – in front of a microphone, that's where you're going to shine uh, with right. your Bears content. And just kind of going through all these years, man, and seeing a lot of people on Twitter who have also grown their own brands. It's been great to see. I love every Bears fan who interacts with me on Twitter. It has five followers who is just trying to get their voice heard and exactly. just needs that retweet or that share. And they could be the most brilliant Bears analyst out there. They just haven't been noticed yet. And, you know, one of the greatest parts of this, what I never could have imagined was connecting. I go down to the senior bowl every year and there are people that are now, I call my friends who before writing about the bears, 
getting into this world, I, they, our realities never would have crossed paths. And it's really something special. Bears fans could be a very uh, interesting bunch on social media, but what I have come to learn very quickly, and it just makes you appreciate the team even more, is that you all share that same passion, right? Yep. You, right. The three of us could disagree on Twitter. Everybody in the comments right now, Bears fans, could be eating each other alive on Twitter over arguing about Cole Komet. The minute a Packers fan enters the chat, yep. the entire Over. group will turn and it's all it's over. Yep. Everybody unifies, and that's the that's beauty true. of the Bears fan. <laughs> that is so true and well said. It listen, I have always been very grateful to you for being one of the first people to really reach out and believe in my talents. And understand you're not lying there. You did say that. And we were trying to make that a part of it. You know, doctors know or whatever it was on Bears Wire where I right. spoke it. Uh, I've never pretended I was the best writer. But now with this chat B GBT stuff or whatever the fuck's going on in this world, <laughs> the EBI, I could be freaking Mark Twain of football at this point. <laughs> so but the reality um, you is guys are you guys you guys are and were and continue to be ahead of your time because this you know having a youtube channel being on patreon having all these active you know subscribers and viewers in your on your network um you know this is really the the new it's not really new i mean i don't want to call it i don't know what the right term is but the way people consume content, you know, going yeah, on a website great. like Bearstalk is great and that will always exist. But the reality is I have my sons, you know, 13 years old. They're on YouTube 24 seven. They're watching video. They're consuming video videos yep. where it's at. And now YouTube has the NFL Sunday ticket. So the end of push in the algorithm for the search results on, on football content, Chicago bears content, it's going to be here. So you guys are, you guys are ahead of the curve, man. Oh, we're glad that we had you on with us as a friend, breaking down the Chicago Bears. If you're not, go over there at the Bears Talk. Follow him there. But Bears Talk, is it BearsTalk.com, right? Yeah, BearsTalk.com. And and um, I appreciate I'm seeing some chats the, in the chat messages, some people saying they signed up. I appreciate that. We do have a premium option which just a little asterisk, I have my developer working on making sure the ads come off on the premium pages. So bear with me. If you are subscribing, you still see some ads that'll get resolved soon and more premium content will be coming as we dive into the 2024 NFL draft. But guys, seriously, you guys are killing it, man. I remember when you launched this and I was like, man, these guys are going to, these guys are going to make it. There's no doubt in my mind. They're going to make it. Well, we I appreciate, appreciate that. We really do. And listen, if you haven't subscribed, and Shane does all the metrics, but some people just, you know, we'll do a show tomorrow morning. It'll be 4,000 people have watched the show by 10 a.m. Just check. I It might be less. Who knows? I'll just throw that out there. But you'll find out like 2,000 of those people aren't even subscribed to the mm -hmm. channel. Like, just make that extra. It helps. Well, sometimes us out. it's way more than that. I yeah. Know. I mean, out of 4,000, you might get 3,400 of them that aren't subscribed. It's crazy. Smash the like button. Follow Brian Perez. Check out. There's, I'm always supporting. I even said it on my drive home from work. I have these conversations with myself. Maybe I'm the only one, but I'm like, I want to support everybody. There's a comedian, Tony. That's a big patron fan of ours. He was shouting out he's, you know, touring his comedy. He's a stand-up comedian. He's been on here as a Bears fan. I just shared his, you know, his touring date. Thank you so much for doing that. It means so much that you share. What is a share? Like, it doesn't take much for people that if you believe in this network, believe in all of us, believe in Brian, let somebody else know about Bears talk or, or the tape never lies. Smash the like button. That's my little PSA as we bring the whole group in here. Sharia is back if you're just tuning in. The great producer, Ivan Vargas, is awake. He's there. He's alive. He's never been asleep. <laughs> I always say that to him. He's never asleep. 
Trust me when I tell you. He's never asleep. Look at that. It looks looks crisp right there. Keep it at 100. Best bear show on the planet. Become a patron. TapeNeverLies.com. Brian, are you going to stick around for a sec? Will sure, man. Whatever you need. Ivan Vargas. Cherie. Was there a favorite pick for you, Cherie? Because we haven't seen you. Is there one favorite pick in this draft for you? She's or were you mute. not following it? Is she on mute? I'm off mute no. now. Oh, Sorry. There you go. You had a uh, Claudio moment again. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, honestly, because of my own stuff, I wasn't following the draft as closely. I only looked at prospects in the first round. So, Honestly, I just wanted a tackle. So my top was PJ and Darnell Wright. So when PJ got off the board, I was just happy we got Darnell Wright. As long as Cherie's happy, I'm happy. Yep. Thomas, Thomas Jones agrees with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Jones agrees with her. Uh, Ivan, your favorite pick? My favorite pick was Roshan Johnson, to be honest with you. There you just, go. Just with everything you've heard, you know, the loss of David Montgomery. Uh, you guys talked about it earlier. You're gaining that back, essentially, with him. Uh, by all accounts, I mean, we still have to see what he does on the field and what he does in the locker room. But if every single person that you run into speaks highly of you, I mean, you got to believe the kid is worth something, you know. Uh, so, yeah, he was he was my favorite. I hope he does a great job. I'm actually rooting for him to potentially push for that number two, possibly number one spot. But we'll see. Yes. <laughs> Ivan Vargas laying down his favorite. Was there a favorite for you, Brian? I would say, in terms of the draft picks, you're saying, right? Yeah. I was just yeah. going through the drafts. Yeah. I had a chat. I want to make sure I missed the question here. In terms of the draft picks, man, listen, Darnell Wright starts right up top, man. I just feel like the only thing I wanted the Bears to do in this draft was make sure we have a chance to get a fair, honest, clean evaluation of Justin Fields. And the only way you can do that for any quarterback in the league, especially after securing DJ Moore in that trade, the only way this was going to happen is if they had a can't miss, well, I shouldn't say can't miss, a surefire starting offensive tackle, not the guard in Skaronsky, not the defensive lineman who has some character issues in Carter or these other guys that might have been on the board or in the discussion for the number nine pick at that time, get the offensive tackle, whether it was Paris Johnson, whether it was Darnell Wright, uh, even Broderick Jones, a guy that you knew was plug and play offensive tackle to round out the off season reconstruction of the line. So Darnell Wright, let's go. Love it. I'm not going to even say mine because Brian Perez said exactly to a T of what I would say. That's why that's my favorite offensive. Uh, at favorite pick, but oh my god, just watching this guy, I can't wait for a lot of these cleanest offensive line gurus on Twitter to watch his tape come the fall because that's when it really <laughs> that's when Adam Hogue lost me, Colin Skaronsky's <laughs> tape flawless. And I'm like, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not smart. The yeah. right stuff. <laughs> you got the right stuff. There you go. Let's not ruin it, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite pick, Shane, or was mine? Would have been Stevenson because I was a oh, big, big you. fan heading into the draft, and he was one of the corners that I talked about a little bit and was very high on my list. And I think he's an absolute perfect fit. Not even just skill level. I'm just talking demeanor. Mm -hmm. He, I think he's going to be a tone setter out there on this defense. And when you you can be a tone setter at cornerback, that says a lot to me. I'm a I'm a big fan. Day, to me, he's day one starting on the outside. You can let Kyler go inside and kind of settle in there. And uh, to Brian's point, like we, I think we're all expecting. Jalen Johnson, I just – I've said it for a long time. I think Jalen Johnson's financial expectations are in a whole different stratosphere than what Ryan Poles 
is for himself. And you hear Eberflus. It's all about ball production. He talked about it with Roquan Smith. And I think it's going to come down to that too with, with Jalen Johnson. One career interception. And speaking of that, with Roquan Smith, I want to we need to start talking. People are talking about ball production with Tremaine Edmonds, and nobody ever talks about passes defensed with him. Right. Go go look at those numbers and then get back to me. It's big difference between him and Roquan. We didn't even get into the free agents with Brian Perez. We talked Bears football for two plus hours straight. You know, first we had to, I'm sorry, Brian, let you wait as we welcomed back our superstar, Lady Bear. Well, good, man. I was enjoying that catering, man, in the green room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then talking fo- Chicago Bears football all night long, getting you guys ready in the off season. There's no commercial breaks. We even came up with our own analogy here, our own pimp playmaker in moments of prominence. That's what the Chicago Bears have lacked. They've been lacking those guys, those pimps out there. TTNL, hopefully they got one as Ivan is talking about. Creating those flash plays like like Brian said. Tyler Scott. Yeah. Tyler Scott. This Sunday, 7 o'clock East, we will be live on our patron channel breaking this guy down. Showing you the tape, why Ivan Vargas is so excited about this football player. With one of the best. Yeah. Matt Baldwin. Baldwin, Coach O, and myself, and maybe Shane and Ivan. I don't know. I haven't talked yeah. to them all week. When is it, Sunday, you said? Sunday. Sunday. If it's, if it's Sunday, Sunday. I'll, I'll, I'll actually be Seven, available. <laughs> there you yeah. go. You're finally off on one day. Yeah. Sunday. I'll, I'll say this. You're going you're, you're gonna to like – the fact that he can do a lot of things very, very well. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding. Let's get hey, it. <laughs> I think he takes a piece from <laughs> our Sunday. I just do that. I kind of like that he does a lot of things very, very well. That's yeah. what she said. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing when I look at Roshan Johnson, he takes. A piece from <laughs> Khalil Herbert's game. He takes a piece from Deontay Foreman's game. Mm-hmm. He takes the pass pro from uh, Travis Homer. I don't know. People don't talk about that. You want to have fun. Go watch that kid in pass pro. For as small as he is, he's a fucking dog. Roshan Johnson has bits and pieces of all of those guys as one back. It's going to be a lot of fun. Breaking it all down this offseason. Brian, we got to have you back on as the preseason hits. So like, let's get just schedule you, pencil you in after that first preseason game. For sure, so me man. and you could say. I'm always around, man. Just any yeah. anytime. Just shoot me a text. And Actually, you know what we should do? We can't, we can't air it live, but maybe we could do a TTNL Bears Talk watch party where we're watching it and reacting to it live on air. There you go. For the fans, fun. that'd be that'd be that cool. That would be fun. It's be just little... so slick and skinny in a hole. Yeah. It... <laughs> not that one. Not that watch party. <laughs> no, we're watching football. That's the wrong watch party, Sheree. <laughs> That's the TTNL after dark, Sheree. Oh, Sheree, 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 Sheree missed that one. Sheree yeah. missed that one. <laughs> Hi. There you go. Yep, I like it. I like it. I like it. We'll get Zorich in there with us talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> him and his 69 uh what is cameo it? followers cameo yeah. followers him it's like 16... what's that say i can't even see it <laughs> look on it and zoom in bro that notre dame education, notre dame education yeah come on all right you know what time it is in the show the real quick version of it real quick real quick Shout out, shout out, shout out. 
know you hear me, baby. Shout out. I know you see me, baby. Shout out. We gotta holla at you. Keep it 100 crew. We gotta show love to you. Shout out. I know you hear me, baby. Shout out. I know you see me, baby. Shout out. We gotta holla at you. Keep it 100 crew. Shout out. Coming at you here. TTNL Network on a Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night, it's keeping it 100. The best Bears show on the planet. Uh, all of us. Tonight, we had the great from Bears Talk, Brian Perez, draft analyst, Bears analyst. And I love the fact that he's not afraid to wear his heart on his sleeve. That's what you do. You don't thumb your nose up. You Stand by your your beliefs. It's going to be a lot of fun seeing how these guys play out. Uh, Cherie, you're finally back here. We missed you so much. I missed you guys too. I'm so glad to see you back. How's mom first? No. She was in the chat. Oh, she's in the chat. I didn't even see her. I wasn't paying attention to many comments except... Ivan showing me Jesus trying to hate on me, but if Jesus yeah, hates me, yeah, Jesus. Yeah, Mother's Day gift early, so um, that's I'm a little irritated because I accidentally sent it early. Well, tell her I said hello. Mother's Day is coming up. Yes, this weekend, Brian. You got to be on top of that. Got to be. <laughs> You gotta bring my uh, free hits account to Bears one. Talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's awesome. Hits inspired Mother's Day. <laughs> it's inspired. It's inspired. I've been cleaning all week, Brian. Been on top of the cleaning in the house, getting the kids ready. Cherie, who are you shouting out, though? Uh-oh, we haven't let the guests go first. Well, I always let the lady go first, but she says, let Perez go first. Who am I shouting Brian? out? Yeah. Who do you I'm shouting you shout out the, the Tape Never Lies crew. You oh, guys do it you the right. You guys do it the right way. You talk about staying true to who you are and and the brand that you believe in. You guys have done this the right way, and, and nothing but absolute respect for you guys for being almost like trailblazers in in what you have built here, betting on yourselves, and by all accounts, from my side of the desk, looking like it's paying off. So, shout out to you guys. It's always look. The timer says, you know, a couple hours have gone by and it's a credit to people when you're in a conversation for that long and it feels like it's just been a few minutes. So uh, it's a credit to what you guys do. Not going to lie, that seven hours of coverage on day three just about ended, Phil, and I actually wanted the fucking draft to end. (laughs) Those last six picks, I'm like, can we just fucking roll this? Get it over with. That one was... (laughs) Oh, I was, was feeling rough. it that next Sunday too. It's just like right here. It's just <laughs> killing me. Yeah, being being on for seven over seven hours straight in a day. That's that's a that's rough. That's a tough one. <laughs> it is. It's tough. No commercials, Brian. Yeah. No commercials. We just kept that's rolling rough. through the coverage. I had a, a, a one of my nine year old football players' mom. It's like, I was watching your draft coverage, and you guys had the picks way before my house, so I was yelling to everybody else who the pick was, and they're like, how do you know? She's like, I have my ways, so I want to shout out Tate Everlight. She she told us that tonight. My wife was cracking up laughing. Cherie, thank you, Brian, for your kind words, and it means a lot. Uh, I respect you, and really love and appreciate you man and everything we do together on getting this football team to be held accountable seems like it's paying off so sheree yes i love balls i know you love balls (laughs) god i haven't heard that in a while (laughs) um who you shouting out tonight as we I got a list. It's been a minute. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Read that list. <laughs> First of all, I do want to say happy birthday to my bestie, Toya. She just turned 40. I'm going to be next. So, 
Um, I'll be joining the 40 Club pretty soon. But happy birthday, Toya. Um, definitely want to shout out the fans, specifically those that were reaching out to me. So I'm going to send love to Will, Bullet, um, HL Priest, and Hans. All checked in on me during this time when I was on my hi hiatus. So I may not have been responsive. I was just, you know, kind of isolating and getting my mind right. It wasn't me being rude or ignoring anybody. But I do appreciate you guys reaching out. And again, to you and Shane and Phil, for being understanding that I was dealing with something and I just needed that space, but still showing me that you cared by reaching out occasionally and checking in, sending me funny videos, Shane, thank you. No! <laughs> so no, just, I love that we are a family and that we do have, like, I, I really feel like you guys are very supportive of me. And anything I need, you guys are there for me. So outside of football, you guys truly are family, and I love you guys to death for it. So thank you. We're no Blake Bortles, but we love you too, Sheree. Oh God, hush up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate you, Sheree. And listen, everybody, we always joke here because that's part of the show. And I think people don't understand. If you look in the bottom under Sheree. We lost one of our biggest fans in Keith Henderson this year. And his wife was in turmoil. He was watching. He, His last thing he watched on TV was keeping it 100. And that's just breaks my heart. And I, I can say a lot of things, but I'm with Brian. And I've said it many times. You know, I have to sometimes... You get browbeaten by these big media types because they're so uh, jealous, I'll say, because we could just say it like it's supposed to be said. But a I won't say all of them because you could see how Kaplan and Cronin and Herb, how all these people that come on the network and just let loose. Adam Rank, one of my best friends, like a brother to me, you know, I'll support his podcast right behind me here. They come in and let loose. Brian let loose. It's keeping it 100. Showing your pride, your analysis, and your passion. Uh, as one as one fan who a, was a friend or somebody close to Keith said, it's like, you guys are like a breakdance battle. It's like, you're not playing. You're going in and doing and giving your thoughts and you perform and humor and that's what sets you apart. It's like you don't do what everybody else. It's not like you guys say surface level bullshit. It's like we're talking about Jasper Horstead. There's no fucking other podcast talking about him tonight. It's just everything is organic. And that's really where it's always going to be. And I, I so respect when someone says, listen, I need a break. And they're so truthful in it. Or they're going through something. Because we're all going through something. There's no measuring stick for it. So all the best to you. I'm so excited that you're back. And anybody that needs time. Even Claudio and his flea market journeys. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan Vargas. I went on a mini rant. I apologize. No, uh, Brian, thanks for coming on, man. Much uh much love and respect. Uh, good luck with everything at, at the Bears talk. Sheree, always love to see you. Actually, Sheree brightens up the show, if you guys didn't know. Yeah, so every time does. Sheree's on, it's like, every, like I mean, you can see it in the chat. Everybody's loving you. I mean, they love Brian, too. Don't get me wrong, Brian. I don't, I don't want to knock it down. But, they, but they're really loving that Sheree's back and everybody's happy. Zorich is here. Look, well. even Look, he came in. Even Chris I came I got it up. <laughs> but uh but yeah that's that's pretty much it glad to have you back sheree brian thanks for coming on i'm done there you go shane marsaw yeah uh brian good to see you again man it's we gotta like i said i think we have to make this watch party happen and try to do things a little bit different i think fans would love it and just a little bit uh different show i think that'd be a lot of fun but uh no shout out to everybody here uh i know lenny apani reached out to me today and his 
father-in-law was just recently diagnosed with leukemia, Ed Taser. So we want to send out some positive thoughts to Lenny and his family uh, and his, you know, wife's side, especially that's never, uh, never easy news to, to get to. But as we all have experienced here, man, that, that power of positivity is a, is a real thing. It's something that I absolutely believe in something that I've experienced in my life. And it's, it's a uh, very, very important. So send some, uh, well wishes Lenny's way to his family and especially his father-in-law as they deal with this, uh, this battle that there's not a family out there that's not affected by, by, you know, leukemia, cancer, just a whole laundry list of, of, you know, unfortunate things like that. Uh, so good luck to him and all the strength in the world, his way on his, on his battle, on his journey with this. Uh, I want to shout out my son, Riley was named student of the month at his nice. school. I don't know where the hell he gets that from. Cause that was you are not, the smartest. Man. That was, yeah, I know just here though. That, that was not <laughs> me in school whatsoever. He asked me, he's like, dad, did you ever get student of the month? I said, no, I had way too much fun in school. I was not a nerd. <laughs> not like you, not like you, but that's, that's how I want my son. So props to him. Uh, it was a good, uh, Nerd alert. exactly. He got up there in front of the school board and, and they read, a. Uh, I think I sent you the video, Phil, yeah, uh, it's great. talking about his, you know, leadership qualities. And when you're a dad and you hear somebody talking about your son like that that i guess that means i'm doing something right raising him uh to be a leader so props to him and uh props to all the fans like i said man over three hours we're still 300 deep here live uh it's a testament to, to everybody's hard work here and testament to our our devoted and loyal fans on a wednesday night to be hanging out this long talking about the Chicago Bears that won three games. We want it. We need it. And we we live it, man. It's going to be a fun 2023 with this team, and I can't wait for it. Well said. Well said. Honestly, I want to shout out Brian Perez for being a stand-up guy, a class act, and standing in his lane in regards to his thoughts and having a laugh with you know, when you break chops with people, you never know how they're going to take it, but he gets it. So give him a follow, go over there, subscribe, do, do your due diligence on getting better educated as a fan. So you're not pulled into these debates of stupidity. Just step away from it. If you have to leave Twitter, do it. It's a healthy thing to stay away from that this stuff. Uh, and Brian, really, thank you for coming on, saying those nice things, and really just being a great guest. It means a lot. Uh, I want to shout out uh, Jim Larison, the, the business head, for his belief, all the things he's done for this network, and his belief in what we were going to do from its inception. Cherie, want to shout you out for coming back. I wasn't expecting you to come back tonight but when i got that text that you were coming back i thought it was going to be next week so now i was even more surprised tonight and you bumped claudio out and you had the perfect open once again Aww. no more moderating for claudio <laughs> he's just he's just gonna do the cut it out segment when that comes back but anyway shout out my boy chris zorich showing up late in the house in the chat no, he wasn't even supposed to be here tonight, but shout you out, Chris. Uh, appreciate all of your support for the TTNL network. Tell Kevin Warren, you know, we're for sale. If they need us to give the Chicago Bears media an upgrade to the fucking lunch with Larry spiel. Oh, my fucking God. Your lunch <laughs> with Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And we'll be there for the Chicago Bears and the Bears fans. Uh, Angelo Joe Marino. I talked to him yesterday. It's his birthday. 
I was gonna call him tonight, but it's too late. I don't I don't wanna keep the show going. Can't but... be funny no more, coach. <laughs> <laughs> He's deciding I I do have an update. <laughs> I do have an update. Uh Angelo will be back this summer. He's gonna come back quarterly. I've negotiated quarterly. Quarterly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way I can pay for the horse, coach. <laughs> uh, you guys in the chat, uh, my man Stewart, uh, all of you guys tonight in the chat, you guys that make this must see TV. People always ask, how's your podcast? Though? I go, it ain't a podcast, bro, it's a show. It's like you got to watch it to get it. And it becomes a podcast, but it's the tape that never lie. You got to see it. And there's a lot of humor and drops, as you can see. And there's a lot of emotion. Once again, the authenticity and organic level with which this show has become, it's, it's where everybody wants to come on the show. Next week, we got Mark Grody coming on the show next wednesday night to talk about the bears and his experience from 670 now it's going over to 1000 we'll talk about all that stuff we didn't even get into the tv stuff the free agent tv deals bears could be playing on cbs sunday and then next week nbc then the next week it could be crazy so we're going to be talking about that as brian mentioned youtube so anyway so much to get into love you guys shout out to all your moms everybody and i'm not shame <laughs> i'm not even gonna go there i fucked no. your mom <laughs> <Oracle> audio <laughs> shout out to all the moms out there have a blessed mother's day hopefully you enjoy uh mother's day and if you're a mom you there god bless you Cherie, you want to give them my a, wife, Steph. What you want to give the mothers a 21 gun salute? For... Sure, what is it? <laughs> I think oh. Ivan, Ivan knows where I'm going. Here, here's oh, no. a 21 gun salute to all the moms out there. I have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> <Look at> Perez. <laughs> Perez is like, yeah, we're not doing that watch party. Fuck that. <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> it's probably the best clip ever. No shitty, no shitty, no... <laughs> Evil. All right. We'll see you Sunday, Mother's Day evening. Uh, breaking down Rashawn Johnson and then we'll announce all our breakdowns coming up from Stevenson to our last pick we'll get it all done hopefully you love the show like subscribe let other people know give Mr. Perez a follow we'll see you next week on TTNL the tape never lies networks keeping it 100 what's up everybody this is NFL Networks Adam Ray this is only This is Matt Waldman. This is Chris Zorch from your Chicago Bear. I'm Dion Miller. Dan Weaver. Hey, my name's Rashad Whitfield. I'm Courtney Cronin. Hey, this is David Kaplan. Listen to me. You want to learn football? Listen to my guy, Phil and Shane. Shane and Phil. Shane and Phil. Oh, Phil. On a tape never lies. On the Tape Never Lies Network. Tape Never Lies Network. The Tape Never Lies Network. Tape Never Lies Network. Home of the greatest Chicago Bears fans on earth.